Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's section on the insurance contracts, IFRS 17, which is expected to take effect from the period beginning 1st of January 2023. That's been extended by the IASB, the International Accounting Standard Board. Today is the 4th of December 2021 when we'll be discussing extensively on this new paradigm. IFR 17, or let me say standard on insurance accounting has been the longest uh, time consuming and effort consuming standard in its whole development. And people have adjusted it as uh, one of the um, most complex, yeah, if not the complex um, accounting standards because of uh, the nature of transaction to which uh, the standard tends to address. It tends to address everything that borders on risk from beginning to the end, which is an insurance contract. Remember, everyone that is willing to avoid the risk or transfer a risk usually other than financial risk that is used, uh, that is transferred through the derivative instrument or other instrument, bulk of risk, business, operational, and the likes are transferred through the purchase of an insurance contract by the insured. And therefore, everything from the angle of the insurer or the reinsurer is much more um, surrounded by a certainty and risk. And on that premise, we'll be discussing on this. Now, to proceed on this discussion, I want us to more or less give one or two expectations that we are going to come across in this discussion. And thereafter, we'll move to the entire discussion. The floor is open for everyone. The floor is open. If I may start. Can I come first? Yes. Okay. Yes. My expectation. Like, um, I must say that um, my knowledge about insurance accounting is zero. And it's because when we were in school, you hardly find school that will teach you anything relating to bank, um, um, accounts of banks and insurance company. And because this very aspect of accounting is not usually tested, maybe in ICANN or any other professional exam. So people don't tend to like look into this area as such. So it's for the essence of knowledge, that's number one. Number two, the standard will be adopted in Nigeria in about two years or thereabouts. So it's very, it's going to be important for everyone of us, be financial experts, financial professionals to also have something to say when this topic comes up to the table. So my own is for knowledge and um, I also want to, be able to discuss this aspect of accounting very well when I am in a program where such needs to be discussed. Thank you very much. Okay, morning everyone. Just to add um, a bit on that. So what I've realized is that when a new standard is coming, it's easier to get that knowledge that time before that standard becomes um, effective, as against when the standard is not effective and everybody is kind of. So it gives you an advantage. And even as a professional, one of your biggest goal is to be ahead of your peers and also stay informed. You know, that's a critical part of what um, either on your own part or your employers expect. So um, starting it early, I think. And one of the things I'll say, for some of the other standards that I'll say for someone like me, I really didn't pay too much attention to. I realized that even to today, I'm still struggling. I can't say I'm 70, 80% proficient in those standards. So 
I think starting it early, it gives you the opportunity to go over, over and over it again and then become a body of knowledge as well in that standard. Okay, who else? Hello, good morning all. Yeah, good morning. Okay, my expectation, my name is Daria Labi. My expectation concerning this training is to, is that the training should afford us the opportunity to know in depth of this particular standard. In my own case, I currently work in an insurance company. I prepare financial statements using IFRS 4. And as we all know that this standard is going to, we are going to start applying this standard in 2023. So my challenge now is to be able to, be able to prepare financial statement applying IFRS 17. That is why I need this standard like like everything is dependent, my career is my career is dependent on this standard, on the ability to apply this standard in preparation of financial statement. Okay, thank you. Who else? Okay, good morning, everyone. Good morning. My name is Sonny Oluwatosi. So actually, um, I look forward to understanding the nitty gritty behind this standard, as in considering that uh, I'm currently working in consulting firm and uh, professional service firm. So and I understand that uh, I think it was a discussion about one month ago that we are going to be having some um, insurance uh, accounting services on board and that uh, the, I, when you look at the team in the accounting advisory that I belong to, so I do not see anyone who has the technical ability for performing insurance services uh, contract, uh, the service. So now, because we are going to be having some clients on board with respect to that, so they are trying to uh, let us know that uh, we might be having some trainings with respect to the standard. Then we had one training. I can almost tell you that it's a two hours training, but it's not, it's not just anything. I'm not, I don't even understand one thing in the training. It's just two hours training. How do you expect us to cover IFRS 17 that I've been hearing that is very technical, even IFRS 9 that we thought is going to be one crazy standard. We're still I'm able to manage that. IFRS. And they're telling us that IFRS 17 is even beyond the technicalities of IFRS 9. Then you are taking us two hours, just train us uh, one thing, one thing, one thing. I said this is not for, for me. So I believe that uh, with uh, a professor in the house teaching us this, uh, and that's most especially why I'm here, that if I can learn this from him, it would afford me a very good opportunity, even though when we have the clients on board, that I can even lead the team. It would give me a very good ability to, to become very uh, uh, resourceful to lead the team in IFRS 17 implementation for clients. That, that's it. Okay, thank you. Who else? Okay, good morning. My name is Uche Chukumonsu. Um, I work with the regulator, National Insurance Commission. So that's, um, that's emphasizing the need for this knowledge because as um, Mr. Miwa has said, when the financial financials of insurance companies start turning in, we're expected to analyze. So it's important that we begin to equip our knowledge with um, the integrities of this of this um, standards so that we can be above board of the operators. So it's quite, um, my expectation is quite high. I need to have a deep understanding so that we're able to uh, um, understand the, the financials that comes from this um, application of this standard. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Muiwa. Um, my wanting this uh, IFRS 17 knowledge is basically out of curiosity and uh, out of just personal interest. 
because I believe that, you know, as a financial reporter, you need to have wide understanding of different aspects of finance and not limit yourself to the areas that are applicable to you. So it's just to be able to know uh, the nitty gritty of the higher fire 17 insurance contracts. And uh, who knows, you know, there may be need to apply it somewhere in the future. So that is exactly why I am curious about knowing about IFRS 17. Thank you very much, everybody. And um, let's start by um, trying to look at one or two videos um, in summary, so that we'll take it up from there and uh, we have extensive discussion interesting discussion for that matter. Okay, uh, anything that it seems to be complex is more interesting in nature, and therefore we should more or less consider it from that perspective. Okay, um, what I'll do now is that I'll switch my screen to give you access to watch this video. IFRS 17 is a new accounting standard that relates to accounting for insurance contracts. It replaces IFRS 4 and is intended to deliver better alignment, transparency and consistency across the insurance industry. IFRS 17 must be delivered by the 1st of January 2022. To create the opening balance sheet and comparatives, insurers will need to look back, sometimes many years. So, what is new about IFRS 17? Profits cannot be booked on day one of the contract. The insurance liability now includes a liability for coverage. The liability for coverage is released as services are provided. IFRS 17 calls this liability for coverage the contractual service margin. How is the contractual service margin measured? The CSM is measured using all the risk-adjusted, discounted future cash flows of the contract. This includes premiums, claims, acquisition costs, related expenses, and where appropriate, investment components. These cash flows may need to be discounted and the discount rate is fixed after inception. A risk margin is then calculated, called the risk adjustment. The total result is called the fulfillment cash flows. So we have future cash flows plus discounting plus risk adjustment equals fulfillment cash flows equals contractual service margin. What is the unit of account in IFRS 17? Policies must be grouped together and the standard gives some rules for this. Policies with similar risks that are managed together must be grouped. The groups cannot cover policies written more than one year apart. These we can call cohorts. Each cohort must be split into groups of policies that are onerous or loss-making, those that will never be onerous, and those that might become onerous. The unit of account or group is therefore a function of the portfolio, time and profitability, and once a policy is assigned to a group, it cannot move. Is there one rule for all insurance companies? The core measurement model is called the general model or building block approach but there are variations for policies with direct participating features called Variable Fee Approach, or VFA. In VFA, no interest is accreted on the CSM, but is adjusted for the movement of the entity's profit from investment activities. There is a simplified version for policies of less than one year called the Premium Allocation Approach, or PAA. In the PAA, the liability is measured based on the premium. This approach can be applied for longer policies, but in that case, insurers have to show the result is similar to the general model. And finally, insurance firms need to think about transition, the period when your existing business needs to be transitioned into the new standards. Three accounting options apply during this time. 
Insurers should process their data from policy inception to the implementation date using the full rules as if they had reported at the time. This is called full retrospective approach. This may not be possible in all cases. The standard has some options called the modified retrospective approach, where some assumptions can be made. There is also the fair value approach, where the initial recognition at the transition date is based on the fair value of the contracts. Implementing IFRS 17 is not easy, with challenges around data, systems and people. It is, however, a great chance to upgrade the back office in preparation for the new digital world. To learn how IFRS 17 is an opportunity for transformation within your firm, please visit www.legerityfinancials.com. Okay, um, we are back. We'll start our discussion by looking at, um, we'll be discussing all of this under five um, sections or chapters. We'll start from the angle of um, insurance contract, what is new at Ghana level. Second session, we'll look at the key terminologies which will form basis of our measurement and accounting for insurance contracts. Thereafter, we look at the, the bulk of what we need to do with respect to measurement of insurance contract liabilities. And we're going to look at the three approaches. What are their unique significance? And their methodology, how it differs? And under what situation? Do we use one over the other? And later on, we'll look at the key reason why an insurer is in the business of insurance is to make profits. Even though it's making this profit by pulling resources together to ensure that anyone within the pool that's experienced a loss, such person is restored and indemnified. Okay, insurance is um, it's more or less like a game of number, which means it's a game of number where everybody has a win-win situation. And where does it come from? Anyone that have a loss within the pool is indemnified by the premium of others. And others also have the rest of mind that in case they are the one who is exposed to such a peril and such a uh, peril crystallizes, it will be indemnified. An insurance company, which is insurer equally, carry out these services in order to earn a margin. And in this case, the margin such earn, which is a profit, is what we we'll call the contractual service margin. And finally, we'll look at transition requirements to IFRS 17 under the three accounting approaches um, to adopting IFRS 17. All of these are what we are going to discuss in this session. Okay, now let's move further. What is new? We we'll start from the objective of IFRS 17. And from what we can see, that IFRS 17, in its practical sense, tend to establish these four key principles, which is also common to any form of transactions in which IFRS has been uh, developed for. And what are they? How do we recognize an insurance contract if we have one as an insurer? What form of measurements in order to ascribe value? Well, because the monetary concept of accounting says that 
you only account for things in your books if they can be assigned or ascribe monetary value, which means anything that cannot be accounted for in terms of naira and color, dollar and cents, pounds and uh, pounds and pence, and any other form of currency of the world will not necessarily be accounted for. And to account for that, we need to measure them, trying to estimate the value at every point in time from origination throughout its life up to the point of the recognition. We also talk about presentation. Presentation is the order to which you report the effect of these transactions within the statements of financial position, which is our balance sheet, the statement of profit or loss, and other comprehensive income, and within the statement of cash flows. And finally, how do we disclose or what do we disclose in order for the users of financial reports to have extensive understanding, clarity, and ability to draw conclusions that will form a basis of their informed decisions. All of these are what the disclosure requirement of insurance contracts under IFRS 17 will avail us. Now, moving forward, we ask ourselves, IFRS 4 exists since 2003, 2004. And IFRS 4 was an interim standard to address just a minute aspect of insurance contracts in which IFRS 17 has come to fully address all of the aspects that have to do with insurance contracts. The question then is, why this long delay? And two, what is unique about IFRS 17 that will more or less place more, that users of financial reports will place more assurance and reliance on in order to provide them with best and informed decision as time goes on. Now, the objective is summarized as follows. The first objective was that IFI 17 provides an avenue for the insurer and the insurance companies to only provide relevant financial information that faithfully represent the activities, the business, the operations, the performance, and the position, including the cash flows of an insurer at any point in time. What that means that before now, we have various methodologies, we have various policies that are not standardized. The word not standardized means that there's no standard that gives you what and what a form of guidance of the methodology towards measuring insurance contract liabilities, unlike IFRS 17. And in that vein, before now, various insurance companies based on regulatory guidance and covered, more or less have different methodologies that they've adopted. And what IFRS 17 has tried to do is to more or less find a unique methodology that does not only standardize all of these methodologies that were in existence before, but equally try to capture things in order to reflect the spirit of the conceptual framework that depicts on our assets, liabilities, equity, income, and expense are recognized. Okay, because these are the five elements of a financial statement. 
Now, in that manner, IFR 17 has provided more or less a soft landing towards integrating across the globe a unique system of accounting for insurance contracts in a way that reflects the substance of the transaction of an insurance contract which borders on risk and uncertainties. Furthermore, IFR 17 gives a sound basis to the users of financial reports to have better information, knowledge, understanding of activities of the business as it affects the financial performance, the financial position, and the cash flow of the entity, which means that users of financial statement, regardless of the subscription of an insurance contract as it is, have, will have better information and better understanding and simplicity and also convergence in the way and manner various insurance companies across the globe report the activities and their performance. These are more or less the summaries of the objective to which IFRS 17 has brought to the table. It then implies that IFRS 17 would effect from 1st of January, 2023, except for those entity that may have early adopted as permitted by the standard will more or less brings about consistency in reporting, in disclosures, and in accounting for insurance contracts. Okay, we move further to now ask ourselves, first, is it all activities of an insurance company that constitute an insurance contract that will be accounted for under IFRS 17. Two, is IFRS 17 only limited to insurance company by legal status? These two questions beg for answers. And the answers are within the scope in and the scope out of IFI 17. What do you mean by that? When you talk about the scope, it means before you apply IFI 17, likewise with any other standards, you must first of all identify that the transaction to which you want to apply a standard falls within the scope to which that standard is applicable. The same way before a medical doctor will treat a patient or recommend drugs or prescriptions to patients. They need to diagnose the patients first to understand the kind of ailments such as to treat it appropriately. In this manner, for IFRS 17 to apply, an insurance contract transaction or related transaction, you must first of all ensure that it's within the scope. And what are within the scope of IFRS 17 can be grouped into three. First, insurance contracts, including insurance contract that is issued by an insurer will surely fall within the scope of IFRS 17. What does that mean? ABC Insurance Company is a composite business. A composite business is where you have a live business and you have a non-live business, which we call general insurance under your portfolio. Okay, we we'll call it a composite. Otherwise, you have either a live business 
or you have a non-life business in your portfolio. Now, for every insurance contract that you issue, or for every insurance contract you issue, you have to apply IFRS 17. Now, later on, we'll see the distribution factor between insurance contracts and insurance contracts. But in a simple way, let me just give you a clue. Now, insurance contract comes with you as an insurer absorbing or taking up significant insurance risk away from an insured. While insurance contract is you taking a portion of an insurance risk that has been taken up by an insurer from an insured in which that former insurer tried to seed off part of his own risk to you and you are willing to accept that risk. Which means it's like you are sharing part of the risk that another insurer has taken up. The second thing is this, you equally apply IFRS 17 to reinsurance contract you owed. What is the difference between the insurance contract you issue and the one you owed? The one you issue is that you assume the position of a reinsurer, where you take up a policy from another insurance company in order to co-share the insurance risk. But for insurance contract you owed, in this case, it means you are the primary insurer who has taken up an insurance risk from an insured, and because of the level of the risk, you prefer to see part of your risk or share that part of that risk with another insurance company for effective coverage. Which means if you are an insurance company that sees part of your insurance risk taken off from the insured, you are equally going to apply IFRS 72. And finally, this is common to life policies where you have a form of investment contracts with discretionary participation features, or in some extent with direct participation features. I'm going to explain the difference between discretionary and direct participation features. You issue, provided the entity also issues insurance contract, which then implies that if you are not an insurance company by legal status, even when you issue investment contract that have one or two policies attached in this kind of discretionary participation features, you may not be able to apply IFRS 17 because the underlying fact is that before you can apply IFRS 17, your modus operandi of operation must be embedded in the business of assuming insurance risk and uncertainty. What that means that if eventually you issue investment contract with DPF, which you call discretionary participation features, but your underlying business operation is that you don't even assume any insurance contract of whatever form with other uh, parties or customers or insured, therefore you are not an insurer in principle. And that simply addresses the second question I tend to ask that, can a company that is not by legal status as an insurer apply IFRS 17? The answer is, it may be impracticable to do so, or because you might not have your contract being defined by an underlying assumption of taking up a significant insurance risk. And we're going to see that by the time we get to the scope out on this case. Now let's look at it also. All references we have to make to IFI 17 on insurance contracts, we apply equally to insurance contract and investment contract with discretionary participation features. Which means as we, any emphasis we make, when we say insurance contracts, it is not limited to insurance contract to issue. It also deals with insurance contract to issue, 
the insurance contract you hold, an investment contract with discretionary participation features you have equally issued out. And that is what we need to take into consideration. Which means this is critical, so that you don't apply Panador when probably you need to apply paracetamol. Do you get what I'm saying now? What that means that we need to understand the mode of brandy, the underlying principle before we apply any form of standard, which is what is discussed at this level. Now, let's look at scope out. If you remember, we've had discussion on IFRS 15. IFRS 15 borders on revenue from contract with customers. Now, in that, we discussed various issues that bother some product warranties and some other things like that. And also, in line with that, reference was made under IFRS 15 to IS 37 with respect to making provisions. Also, as it relates to product warranties by insurer, uh, by dealers, retailers, and manufacturers. Therefore, anything relating to product warranties issued by manufacturers, dealers, or retailers are outside the school of IFRS 70. Likewise, to some extent, certain financial guarantee contracts will not fall under an insurance contract accounting. That's IFRS 17. Okay, and this especially relates to financial guarantee contracts issued by financial institutions other than an insurer, and also to some extent, some issued by an insurer that may not have carried a significant insurance risk, may not fall under that. And lastly, most form of fixed fee service contracts will not fall under IFRS 17 because most of them are within the scope of IFRS 15 and any other relevant standards. What that means that issues that borders on this that may look like an insurance contract, but not really an insurance contract, will not be treated under the provisions and requirements of IFRS 17. And we need to take note of that. Okay. Now let's look at the underlying principles and features of I-517. Now, there are three key features that underlines the adoption of I-517 as it supersedes any other standards that may have been adopted in the past with respect to insurance contract accounting. Now, the significant of this is that one, the level of transparency as depicted by this standard is sequa non, is next to none. What it then means is that these standards are tend to increase the transparency in the financial information reported by insurance companies. Now, why this transparency? One, is because everyone is using the same model. Two, the model for being the one recognition of profit, even when you have a profitable policy being underwritten. What that means that the profit is expected to be recognized in tandem with the conceptual framework and other standards in a manner that reflects the economic substance of the transaction, so that the profits are recognized as services is being rendered by an insurer to the insured over the coverage period. Second one is that the consistency in the accounting for the insurance contract is guaranteed so that it increases comparisons, it increases the level of disclosures and some other activities. And finally, the adequacy 
and the reliability of the financial information as it depicts the financial position, the financial performance, and of the cash flow of the entity is what can be reckoned with. And what this signifies is that this standard, IFI 17, has come to bring three key things to the table. One, it brought transparency to the table, it brought consistency to the table, and it brought in reliability and adequacy in financial reporting as it relates to insurance business. Now, at this point, I would also likely want to share one video again with us introducing the insurance contract. And this video is from the perspective of an insurance company, one of the top notch insurance companies around the world for you to have better view of the position as it is. As an Allianz employee and Allianz shareholder, you want to understand the financial strength of our company. So do our customers and investors. From 2021 on, the way we present our financial statements is changing. This is because of a new accounting standard, IFRS 17. This is the first harmonized accounting model for insurance contracts. Making these changes involves a lot of hard work and investment but doing so will increase the transparency of our financials and make it easier for customers and investors to compare our performance with our peers. It's important that we all understand what it means. So let's see how it works. The Allianz Group consists of three business segments, property, casualty insurance, life health insurance, and asset management. IFRS 17 affects our insurance businesses only. Asset management is not affected at all. IFRS 17 foresees a simplified approach that is similar to our current accounting for short-term contracts. As our property casualty insurance contracts are typically short-term contracts, we are allowed to apply the simplified model. We expect the biggest changes in our life health insurance segment. To understand how IFRS 17 works in the life health insurance segment, let's walk through the new approach step by step. When we enter into new insurance contracts, we will have to make an estimate of all the cash flows that we expect to receive and expect to pay over the coverage period. First, we record all inflows, such as insurance premiums, and deduct all estimated future outflows, such as claims, administration, and acquisition expenses. Next, these cash flows need to be discounted to their present value. Now, IFRS 17 applies a risk adjustment which represents compensation for the risks taken over from the policyholders. Overall steps one to four represent the so-called fulfillment cash flows that are fulfilling our obligations to our customers. The remaining slice is the contractual service margin or CSM. The CSM reflects the profit we expect to earn over the lifetime of contracts. IFRS 17 doesn't allow us to recognize any of this profit when we issue the contracts, but lets us recognize it slice by slice as we fulfill our promises to our policyholders over time. The slice represents our profit for the period. Making estimates of all the cash inflows and outflows require us to look a long way out into the future, particularly for our long-duration life health business. At each reporting date, we must update all the estimates that we have made. These updates may also have an impact on the profit that we expect to earn from the contracts. 
Let's look at a simple term life insurance contract as an example to understand how the model works. At the beginning of the contract period, we assumed a life expectation based on past experience and future expectations. After some time, we adapt our assumptions due to changing trends in life expectancy. Let's assume that the expected mortality decreases and we expect fewer payments to the policyholder. In our model, the outflows are getting smaller and therefore our CSM gets bigger. You could think of it as the pie that we are making has just got bigger. Our profit increases because it reflects a slice of a bigger pie. So what are the key changes in our financials? On the one hand, it is key to know that our profit is based on current measurements and will recognize it as we provide insurance services to our customers. On the other hand, you will be able to find the CSM in the balance sheet, reflecting the future profits we expect to make from our core business, servicing insurance contracts. And why is that important? It will increase the transparency of our financials, making the value we create for our customers and shareholders more apparent. This also will make it easier for our investors to compare our performance with the performance of our competitors. Knowing the principles and advantages of IFRS 17 means being able to understand and communicate the financial strength of Allianz because the way we measure it is becoming more transparent and easier to compare. Okay, we are back. Now we need to discuss why has IFRS 17 been developed? And this is going to give credence to what we discussed before the video, where we identified the three key features or benefits associated with IFRS 17 as being issued by the ISB. Remember the three key features were transparency, consistency and the reliability that embeds the adequacy of financial information as it's been made available to users of financial reports. Now, at this point, we'll be discussing on the following. The first reason why IFR 17 was developed was to ensure that the economics of the insurance business is appropriately represented. Or because the economics of business before now were poorly depicted or represented. Now, and this was as a result of lacking in relevance and transparency of information before now. Now we'll look at it. What are the issues? affecting insurance accounting prior to now? And how has this formally undermined various analysis, information, and decision that has been made over time? First, we look at lack of useful information. It's identified that most of the assumptions that were adopted under the various models are outdated assumptions, which means those assumptions do not necessarily speak to one of the key measurement of value as depicted by the revised conceptual framework in 2018. And what is that key measurement, current value? And current value speaks to the fact that every value for asset or liabilities 
that represent your financial position must reflect current circumstances, current condition, current information amidst historical data and also future expectations. And that's why you find out that under the revised conceptual framework or the newly issued conceptual framework in 2018, you find out that the current value have three methodologies under it. One is a fair value. One is a present value, which is considered to be value in use for an asset once you consider the contractual cash flows over the life of that asset. Or fulfillment value when you consider the contractual cash flow over the life of the liability. All are still talking about present value. And the third is the current cost. Now, this is just to more or less give us some background to the fact that most of the value ascribed to insurance contract liability under various models before now are either outdated or old assumptions. Secondly, under the lack of useful information, options and guarantees are not necessarily fully reflected in the measurement of insurance contract liabilities. And we're going to see that as we move on. And also, the use of expected return on asset held as discount rate is no longer valid or a valid assumption in the measurement of insurance liability. And we're going to see that as time goes on. How does this undermine various analyses, decisions that were taken in the past is that Fundamental economics are not necessarily reflected in the reported financial statements, which means there's a divergent view between financial report and the economic substance of the activities of insurance companies. Another one, which is a category, is a lack of transparency about profitability. Now, because of divergent views and because of different methodology being adopted, profits recognized are barely at different points. Some methodologies allow for profit recognition at the inception. Some allow for profit recognition towards the end. Some evenly or unevenly distributed over the coverage period. Okay, and likewise also, because there's no standardization, some based on regulatory cover and others make use of non-GAAP measures. Remember GAAP means generally accepted accounting principle. Some make use of industry measures that are not necessarily in tandem with the concept of financial reporting. And therefore, there's a mix of many things in order to provide solution towards financial reporting issues, given that there's no concrete standard that have addressed such. And on that basis, it makes comparison among companies difficult. And that's why you see that sometimes insurance companies may not be compared easily, especially across jurisdictions. You might still likely compare them within jurisdiction because of regulatory cover, like the guidance from NICOM and the likes. But once it becomes cross country, it's no longer the same because they are not under the same regulation. Okay, but in today's world, we will now have to standardize our reporting makes our disclosure standardized and comprising much more effective across insurance businesses within the deal. Furthermore, we also look at the second category that speaks to the lack of comparability. A lack of comparability can be associated with inconsistency in the application of 
the methodologies, the policies, the assumptions underlining the measurement of insurance contract liabilities. Similarly, lack of disclosure can also increase our lack of comparability. And therefore, we look at it that what are the issues today with respect to that? One is that lack of comparability among insurance companies has made it difficult to rely on most of the financial reports in order to make decisions. Also, sometimes because of less of uniformity within the group, even we have sometimes we have a group of insurance companies, which means you have a parent that's an insurance company, probably a composite, you have a subsidiary that is live, another one that is general, but their policies are not necessarily in tandem, probably because they are operating in different jurisdictions. The parent insurance company might be based in London. The Nigerian subsidiary is under NICOM. The London subsidiary is under their own regulations there. And therefore, the caveat that is given may not be the same. And therefore, it makes consolidation uh, of the position as a group more difficult and more erroneous if it's not appropriately done. And therefore, all of these are what we need to take into consideration. The new framework will replace the huge variety of accounting treatments because we have streamlined the accounting treatment under three models, which we are going to discuss. In the interim, the models are the general measurement model, which is otherwise known as the building block approach. We have the variable fee approach, which is a modification of the general measurement model. And the last one is a premium allocation approach, which is familiar with, uh, is synonymous to some extent, not in totality, with the on end premium reserve approach that has been used majorly by general insurance businesses. Now, furthermore, inconsistency with other industries, as I've said earlier, revenue recognition by insurance company before now, especially for life policies, are not in tandem with the revenue recognition even prior to IFRS 15. Both IS 18 and IFRS 15, the revenue recognition of insurance businesses, especially for life policies and uh, life businesses, are not necessarily close or in tandem with those of other industries. And most times, the revenue are reported on a cash basis, which is more or less an anomaly to the principle of revenue recognition on the accrual basis of accounting. And therefore, the solution IFRS 17 has brought to the floor is that revenue will now reflect the level of services provided by an insurance company, excluding deposits, and you are going to see that later, that when you have an investment or deposit component embedded in an insurance contract, it will be required that such have to be split away from the insurance contract, such that that will be accounted for appropriately under the requirement of IFRS 9, which is financial instruments, while the portion that deals with the significant insurance risk being transferred by the insured will be applied in line with IFR 17. Okay. Now, application of IFR 17 along with other IFRSs. I've said it over time, even in all of our discussions today, that IFR 17 does not necessarily stand alone, but again, because there might be embedded contract where we have other service contracts or investment contract attached to an insurance contract. To a great extent, such will have to be separated. Okay, which means the investment contract have to be split away from the insurance contract 
Likewise, any form of service contract have to be separated from the insurance contract. And what that means or presupposes is that such investment contracts will be applied, will be accounted for in line with IFRS 9, which is financial instruments, and service contracts will be separated and IFRS 15, which is revenue from cost, uh, contract with customers will be the standard applicable to the service contract. With them is that at no point will you account for insurance contract alongside with other contracts that are not insurance contracts under IFRS 17. And that is one of the key things we need to take into consideration. And we're going to see that with some illustrative practices. Now, let us now look at the overview of insurance contracts under IFI 72. Now, one is that IFI 17 relates solely to accounting for insurance contracts and doesn't extend to any form of contract that does not carry significant insurance risk. Also, it primarily replaced IFRS 4, which was an interim insurance contract, and it replaces it and any other existing gap, be it IFRS or non-IFRS measures that have been adopted before now in order to cover for areas to which IFRS has not taken care of, which means no other gap can be used in tandem with IFRS 4 or with IFRS 17 in order to cover up for insurance contract accounting beginning 1st of January 2023. Such will no longer be permitted. Otherwise, such will be considered not to be IFRS compliant financial statements for such an insurance company. Also, it requires consistency in accounting for all insurance contracts based on current measurement model, which is synonymous to our current value as a measurement basis under the conceptual framework for financial reporting as issued by the International Accounting Standard Board in March 2018. Also, it provides some level of useful information about the profitability of insurance company. And we're going to discuss extensively on that, where we'll talk about the contractual service margin, which is synonymous to what we call the liability for coverage or what we call the profits of the policy over its life. And we're going to see that as we move on. And uh, finally, transparency is key. The adoption of IFRS 17 has come to stay and has come with it high level of transparency in the reporting of the activities of an insurance company across the globe. Now let's look at this on a side-by-side -side basis. What improvements have been brought to the floor? Sorry. Excuse me, Mr. Muiwa. Yes, sir. Please, can I ask a few questions or I have to wait to the end of the presentation? Okay. Um, probably we'll wait to the end of the first module. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, I'm trying to, my system is not allowing me to convert it strictly to slideshow, but I'll check it later on. Okay, now let's look at five key areas to which improvement has been made, significant improvement and paradigm shift. 
The first aspect is accounting treatments. Now we are comparing IFRS 4 and every other practices before now with the single model under IFRS 17, which is a new practice. Now the first aspect of it is accounting treatments. How do we treat insurance contract as of today and how are we going to do that in the future? Before now, several treatments are allowed because it has not been standardized. And therefore, that creates a lot of inconsistencies, which IFRS 17 has come to erase. Now, since we only have restricted models under strict guidance, principles, and some set of rules, consistency is not being guaranteed based on that limitation. Secondly, what is the basis of estimation? Okay. Insurance contracts with short duration is not necessarily of a problem. And there's no significant material difference between IFRS 4 and most other practices and IFRS 17 when it comes to a short-term insurance contract, which is characterized by a period of 12 months or less. But majorly for long-term insurance contracts, whether non-life and primarily life contracts, you find out that estimates made are not necessarily updated because there were no specific guidance to that. What does that mean? It means that a life policy that you took over five years ago, the assumptions made then are primarily the assumptions still add up to today without material updates based on microeconomic changes, based on actuarial assumptions, and based on some financial variables. But under IFRS 17, it is now compulsory that a continuous and at least a periodic update of various assumptions, including actuarial assumptions, including demographic assumptions, including microeconomic variable assumptions or financial variable assumptions have to be updated from time to time in order to reflect the current measurement model that I've been described earlier. Also for the discount rates. The discount rate adopted only reflect the economic risk associated with the insurance contracts before now. But the discount rates that need to be adopted now should reflect the economic assessment of the cash flows of the contracts. Now, what is the difference? One is only looking at the, let me say the actuarial assumptions underlining the policy taking without necessarily looking at the contractual cash flow changes that comes with such changes. What that means that the discount rate we are going to use now is a discount rate that only reflects the economic characteristics of the cash flows that is associated to that policy. What does that mean? It means the variability in the premium collections this at least the variability in the claims to be made or paid will have to be taken into consideration in establishing what is the appropriate discount rate. And we're going to look at that as time moves on. Secondly, or next to it is that most times before now, the effect of time value of money was somewhat neglected to some extent, not in all cases. Unlike now, that time value of money will always be taken into consideration. 
in order to measure insurance liability, except for insurance liability that have a period that is so short. Probably we are talking of liability that is due in the next one month, two months, three months, of which effect of time value of money is insignificant. But for any policy where effect of time value of money is significant, it must always be taken into consideration. And finally, because of the IFRS 4 and every other old practices, lack economic value with respect to financial information provided. And what this means is that because of the insufficiency in the information regarding the economic value associated with the contract that are some other embedded options in it, we find out that such information lacks reliability, which has been adopted over time by users of financial reports in making informed decisions. What then has IFI 17 bring to the floor? It has brought to the floor the measurement of insurance liability that at all times reflect necessary information associated with various possibilities, degrees of outcomes, or state of nature as regarding the insurance contract that they have undertaken. And we are going to see this in the process of the modeling of the insurance liability. Furthermore, how does IFI 17 impact our financial statements, especially with respect to balance sheet and our profit or loss and with disclosures? There is little or no impact of IFI 17 on cash flows. When I say cash flow, in terms of presentation, because cash is cash, okay, and cash is not measured, but it may have impact on liquidity of an insurance company going forward, which means insurance company should be more liquid in the future because of the conservative and the prudence principle of recognition of profits. Because now profit recognition will be made more or less on a systematic basis to reflect the services that have been rendered. Unlike most times, under the current uh, uh, philosophy where profit is influenced by much more of underwritten policy in a year, because most times profit are recognized earlier than necessary. And secondly, losses are not necessarily recognized immediately because it has been commingled. Insurance policies that are loss making has been commingled with those that are profit making, such that under this current regime of IFI 17, you need to characterize your contract from inception into three buckets. What are the buckets? Profit making policies have been estimated in a separate bucket. Onerous contract, which are loss making contract from inception when you under write the contract, you know it's a loss making in a separate bucket. And the third one are profit making policies, but are likely to be loss making or onerous as time progresses based on changes in microeconomic and other variables. With them is these three buckets. We will now increase the level of transparency so that the profit-making bucket, you recognize profit on a systematic basis, which we are going to see today. For loss-making, you are going to recognize the loss immediately upon inception of the policy. Why well, for the third categories that are profit making, but they may become loss making or onerous insurance contract. What you do is that you apply the same principle as profit making over the life of the contract up to the point where it became onerous and the entire loss will be recognized immediately 
at the point it became onerous. And we are going to see that with demonstration of basic models and simple models. We are going to see that today. Okay, now these are the key things we need to take note of. Now, it will be shocking that the structure of our balance sheet has been slightly changed and massively the structure of the statement of profit or loss has totally been changed. I am going to see significantly. The only point it will not materially change is for non-life policy businesses like general. And since general businesses much more are short-term businesses, you'll find out that there's no material difference in presentation of the profit or loss. But for life policies, you see how material it is. And we'll discuss on some critical issues that it may bring to the table, including the tax implication that may come up in this. Okay, now disclosure requirement. Now, when you look at the disclosure, extensive disclosure will be made that will allow users of financial information to have a better understanding of the financial information for the sole purpose of making decisions. Now, let me just read out excerpts from the standard as it provides guidance about the impact in the presentation in the financial statement. Now, I-517 requires current measurement model where estimates are measured in each reporting period. Now, that especially affects the balance sheet because what you are measuring are either the insurance contract assets, which in quotes may not be recognized, and we're going to see that, and two, the insurance contract liabilities. Now, the measurement is based on building blocks of discounted on by has probability weighted cash flows alongside a risk adjustment and a contractual service margin representing the on end profit of the insurance contract. Now, for the statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income, the requirement in IFR 17 aligns the presentation of revenue with other industries. Investment components are excluded from revenue. Entities have accounting policy choice to recognize the impact of changes in discount, in profit or loss, or in other comprehensive income to reduce some volatilities in profit or loss. That especially affects the second model, which is the variable fuel approach. And we're going to see that as time soon go Because for the general measurement model, the discount rate may not be subjected to changes, and therefore the issue of recognizing or having a policy option to recognize some element within OCI will not be available in that instance. And finally, for the disclosure, IFR 17 discloses more details than the current reporting. And I will call it more relevant details, not just information, which we are going to see. Now, Disclosures will provide additional insight into key judgments and profit emergence by an insurance company. Disclosures are also designed to allow greater comparability across insurance businesses, not only within a jurisdiction, but across the globe. For those that will be adopting IFI 17. Okay. What is the changes within the component within the financial statements? As I've said earlier, IFR 17 principle of identification of transfer of insurance risk is consistent with IFR 4. The underlisted standard applies to transactions associated with insurance contracts, which we have discussed earlier. Remember, service contracts have to be spin off or separated and accounted for under IFR 15. Why investment contract or deposit contract have to be separated and accounted for under FRS 9. Now, we'll finish the first module. And the module is just to give us background about the history, 
about the changes and about the reason or rationale behind moving from the old practice to the new practice and what form of changes should we expect? Okay, the floor is open for questions and answers. Okay, sir. Um, I think I should go first. So I have uh, a few questions I would like to, to ask. Uh, thank you for the powerful presentation. It's so clear and you know loaded. So number one is that you mentioned something direct, discretionary, participatory futures. It sounds big to me because I'm not an insurance expert. So maybe as time goes on, uh, you, will, you will shed more light on that. And uh, my second question is that here in Europe, there is something we call the solvency two, which uh, applies to all insurance companies. And it's also adopted by the European Commission and the European Union as, uh, a, as, as you know, a guideline for insurance reporting. So now that IFRS 17 is also like adopted by the same union, I think even Europe is like at the forefront of this adoption. How with these two shake hands, does IFRS 17 repeals solvency too? Or insurance companies have to like uh, commingle the two standards. So I really want to know what plays out between these two. And uh, my third question is that uh, you talked about, uh, okay, my third question is just like a scenario. For instance, if I am like an innovator that I innovate uh, products for maybe a fashion company, let's say Louis Vuitton or anything like that. And I, I'm, I'm telling Louis Vuitton that because of my ingenuity, I will make series of products for you and I can assure you that at the end of the year, you will make this revenue that even if you're unable to make this revenue, then I will have to like make it up to that actual amount that I have promised you. So I am providing that guarantee. And also there's a level of risk attached to it because it's possible you don't make that revenue at the end of the day. So that means that I'm taking up substantial risk. So can we say this is an insurance contract? If that is a business of that company taking up such a risk, does it qualify as an insurance contract to be accounted for under FRS 17? So that is another question I want to ask. Now, when we talk about IFRS 17, we talk about IT, we talk about actuary, we talk about accounting. And in fact, even when I was talking about this program, a lot of IT guys who are my friends wanted to like uh, apply for, in fact, IT guys are even learning IFRS 17 a lot. So I want to know how this relates to IT, to actuary, and we've understood the accounting side of it. Now, I think the question, this is this last one to make it easy. <laughs> okay, so for it, we, we're talking about live coverage now. Maybe it's, it extends 20, 30 years. And there could be major shift, major events. Nobody, nobody forecasted uh, COVID-19 in one or two years ago and it happened. So how does uh, unexpected future events, major ones, affect the way we forecast our cash flow? Because forecasting is now very, very paramount in IFRS 17. Okay, um, I think let me start from behind so that um, I'll not forget the last two, three questions. Because what I've seen is that you've asked about five or six questions. Now, the first thing is this. That is why, okay, let me start from the last. The last one is um, paradigm shifts because of the longevity of the period in concern, especially for life policies. Now, that's why you find out that the standard says that um, on a yearly basis, you must remeasure 
your liability based on current information. And current information will have reflected some expectation in the most immediate period, which means much reliance will be based on information at the present and what you can see from that present into the future than what you have seen from the back, which addresses that position. And that is why the standard also provided guidance from inception of the contract to classify or to group your contract into profit making, loss making, and those ones that are in between. You're initially profit making, but they might become loss making. You understand? And as time progresses, issues might warrant such that what is profit making based on the paradigm shift in the larger economic variables like what you have described, COVID and all sorts of things, can make such profit making become loss making. Do you understand? The current system of remeasurement will address that position at every point in time. That's why we said IFRS 4 and any other passes before now are usually outdated because they don't necessarily reflect the current assumptions or current information. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, the second one, which I can easily speak to, is issue of... Um, uh, what's it called? Uh, uh, Louis Vuitton, if I could get the example well. Yes. Okay. Now, what happened there is that there is a significant difference between financial risk and investment risk. Do you understand? What they have taken over is not insurance risk, it's purely a financial risk. And that doesn't fall under insurance contracts, which means you must understand. And that's why we said, do Louis Vuitton primarily issue insurance contracts in any form apart from what he has done? The answer is no. Therefore, it means what he has more or less taken over is a speculative risk by way of investment or financial risk, as the case may be. Therefore, such will not qualify as an insurance contract. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes, now, let me now shift to the front. Um, the first question you asked is about discretionary participation features. Okay. And there's also direct participation features, I will explain. Now, discretionary participation features always come with a form of investment contracts. You know, there are some policy contracts, if you are familiar with life policies. Although uh, in Nigeria, it exists to some extent. Where you take up an investment policy, investment contract with a, a, with a company, insurance company, and there's an element of insurance cover on it. Not only that, the policy you took is such that whenever there's a profit in a year, there's a discretion by the insurance company to share part of the profit to the policy holder of a particular type of uh, policy that has been underwritten. Therefore, when they market those policies to you, they'll tell you that apart from your investment growing, you also have some distribution of profit based on the performance and other things. What that means that in such a way and manner, it means there is an additional risk because the investment contract have to be separated. But because this investment contract does not necessarily carry uh, what we call a guarantee return, but rather it carries you having to participate at the discretion of the insurance company in its underlying profit. Therefore, such contract will be treated as a whole as an insurance contract. And in that case, that profit element will also be measured as part of the liability for the purpose of IFRS 17. Now, there's also a slight difference between investment contract with discretionary participation features and an insurance contract with direct participation features. Now, insurance contract with direct participation features are those that you took a life policy. And apart from the coverage of that policy, 
which is purely life, not investment in this case, you directly have a percentage which has been predetermined as your share of profit in the insurance company. You can see now. That's why you have issues whereby profits. Before now, if you check the old accounting methodology of SAS in Nigeria, we have what we call profit distributed into policyholders share and uh, shareholders share and all sorts of things like that. That also comes in that light. And that is what we're saying. Now to also buttress that, let me try and show you something. Let me share the screen and show you something there. Can you read up this? OK, sir. A discretionary participation feature, DPF, as defined in Appendix A of IFRS 4, is a policy holder's contractual right to receive certain supplemental benefits in addition to the guaranteed benefit under the contract. A number yeah. of insurance contracts contain a discretionary participation feature. Now let's now look at investment contract with that discretionary participation features. Okay. What are okay? What are investment contracts with discretionary participation features? The term investment contracts with discretionary participation features describes contracts under which the investor receives an additional payment, the amount or timing of which the contractually of which is contractually at the discretion of the issuer. And the word discretion. discretion of the issuer. Now let's now compare that with direct participation features. Okay, direct, okay, insurance contracts with direct participation features are insurance contracts that are substantially investment related service contracts under which an entity promises an investment return based on underlying items. Now, this return is guaranteed. And you find out that most insurance companies in Nigeria, this is what they now issue. I don't know of France where you are, but this is what they issue mostly in Nigeria that they will tell you, uh, apart from your policy, you get a 4% uh, investment return and all sorts of things like that, like that. That means it's an insurance contract with a direct participation features. You understand? We also have investment contract with discretionary participation features. You understand? They are not necessarily the same, but they share something in common where you participate in certain returns from the profitability of the insurance company. Okay. Now you also ask a question on solvency. Okay. Um, solvency two, you know, uh, as Basu. One, two, three is to banks. Mm -hmm. That's how solvency one, two is to insurance company. Now, in the development of IFR 17, the same way Basel was carried along by the IESB and the various uh, society for investment and the likes, including CFA and the likes, carried during the period of developing IFRS 9 standard for financial instruments, so was how IESB carried along the insurance community, including the city of actuary, various insurance uh, associations, and everyone along with regulators in the development of insurance contract standard of IFRS 17. It even got to a level where IFRS 17 was totally rewritten. And that brought about a series of delays because they need to come into uh, a, a unanimous decision towards what is acceptable. To a large degree, you find out that the principles of IFRS and that of Solvency II are in tandem to a large degree though they might have some little differences because the objectives 
also are slightly different. The objective of IFRS borders on solidifying financial reporting. Why the objective of Solvency II is much more of regulatory capital protection and some other things. But they share most things in common. And you find out that IFRS has also shifted a little towards Solvency II with respect to imbibing economic characteristics of cash flows and some other things in your measurements. So that there's no divergent view between the economic characteristics of your activities and your financial reporting. Similar to what happened in financial instrument, where much more of edge accounting embedded and everything has not been integrated so that it speaks to the risk management aspect of your activity than just the accounting aspect of it, which was during the period of IS-39. And similar things happened there. Now, let me share one or two things here I've seen here. Now, um, sorry. OK, I want you to read something there from SAS. OK. IFRS 17 and Solvency 2, insurance regulation meets ins Insurance regulation meets insurance accounting standards. In addition to Solvency II, which went live January 2006 in the European Union, another regulation will soon change the face of the insurance industry, IFRS 17, formerly known as IFRS 4 Phase 2, issued by the International Accounting Standards Board, IASB. The objective of IFRS 17 is to improve financial reporting by providing more transparent, comparable information about one, the effect of the insurance contracts on financial performance, two, the way by which entities earn profits or incur losses through underwriting services and investing premiums from customers, three, the nature and extent of risks that companies are exposed to as a result of issuing insurance contracts. IFRS 17, starting in 2023, will introduce additional requirements regarding calculation and disclosure of various financial measures. The goal is to ensure high quality, understandable, enforceable, and globally accepted financial reporting standards based upon clearly articulated principles to improve transparency and comparability of insurers' financial statements, regardless of sector, geography, or product. In a similar vein, so Solvency II's goal is to establish a common regulatory framework to maintain capital adequacy and risk management standards for those who operate in the EU. The aims of IFRS and Solvency II are to facilitate comparability and transparency from a regulatory and accounting perspective to external stakeholders in contrast to the divergent practices and measures that currently characterize insurance reporting. Look at similarities and differences. Can you read it out? OK. Similarities and differences between IFRS 17 and Solvency 2. In the EU UK, insurers have made significant investments in new systems to which to comply with Solvency 2. Some of them can be useful for IFRS 17. Although Solvency 2 and IFRS 17 requirements have different objectives, there are some similarities regarding the measurement of insurance contract liabilities, including using a estimates of future cash flow, bail of fulfillment cash flow. B, discount rates, discount rates consistent with current rates in the financial market for S11 risk free rate. And C, adjustments for risk, risk margin, risk adjustments. Because of the investments made in new system and processes and the potential for synergies with IFRS 17, in areas such as data collection, modeling systems, and reporting lines, the ISB expects that companies required the, to comply with Solvency II requirements. Or, can you scroll up, sir? Okay, or other similar prudential regimes 
we use systems and processes already in place as a starting point for IFRS 17 implementation. The key differences between IFRS 17 and Solvency 2, the new requirement to calculate and maintain a contractual service margin, except when the simplified approach is used. B, the new requirement to calculate the insurance revenue measure. And C, the need to analyze movement in fulfillment cash flow between those that will be presented in the profit or loss and those that will be presented in other comprehensive income and those that will, that will be offset against the contractual service margin. margin. You are muted, sir. Yeah, that speaks to that. Your final question was on IT guys. Yes. Now, um, IT guys are much more important to the success of adoption of IFI 17 as you and I that are accountants. If not much more important because by the time we display what we want to display, and by the time we finish all this, you will now see that it is practically difficult, if not impossible, to execute I-517 without a robust technology in place. And the challenge I have for Nigeria is, do we have such? Unlike banks that during the impairment period, IFRS 9 and also of things, they invested millions and billions in systems. But Nigerian insurance company, how would they be able to invest such? Europe have enough to invest because they are even bigger than banks. Some of them even owns banks. You understand what I'm saying now? But in Nigeria, the penetration of insurance as a business is very low. And therefore, the money is not even there to invest. Therefore, how would they do that? That is where the problem lies. Now, technology is the other big deal in the adoption of IFI 17. For example, no matter the knowledge you have with impairment assessment, without the aid of technology, as simple as Excel modeling, talk less of software and other things, you cannot do it because it's not about debit or credits. You cannot even forecast, you cannot project, you cannot do anything. And that's where the problem lies. And that equally is my fear. And we're going to see that towards the end of the discussion where we'll look at what next in the successful transition to IFI 17. Therefore, those guys are as much more important in the success of the adoption than probably you and I. You can see now. And that's why you, and you know technology, technology though is a tool, but to have it effective, those developing it must have understanding of what they want to develop it for. Otherwise, it will just produce a garbage in, garbage out stuff that will provide little benefits of what you need to derive. And that is that. I believe I've answered about six of your questions. Yes, 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 you did. Okay. Over to others. Any other question? Any other question? Mr. Uche from Michael, what's your view? It's okay, and your presentations were clear um, and um, very educated. So I, I think it's more of the preliminary stage where we we'll move to the difficult areas. I'll be I'll be troubled. I'll be asking questions. <laughs> okay, let me also call the representative of the Shora, Mr. Dari. No question for now, sir. If I have any question, I will throw it off, sir. Okay, okay. No problem. Okay. 
Okay, uh, before we go into some key terminologies, we are going to more or less watch this uh, 10 minutes video. And uh, that will also introduce us to one or two things. And uh, from there, we'll move on. And others will be marked on detailed modeling and some other things. Okay. I'm Gail Tucker, PwC's Global Accounting Lead on Insurance. I'm a member of the recently formed ISB's Resource Transition, Transition Resource Group on RFRS 17 and also a member of EFRAG's Insurance Accounting Working Group. I'm delighted to be joined today by Sandra Thompson, who's our Global Financial Instruments Leader in our Accounting Consulting Services. So RFRS 17 came out in May and it's quite a complex standard. Um, it's quite interesting that when we look at insurance contracts around the world, they look different in different parts of the world and they're certainly accounted for differently today. What this new standard does is make account insurance contracts be accounted for consistently, which inevitably means there's a lot of change for everyone who issues insurance contracts. It will not only change the measurement of the liability, it's also going to change what the uh, profit recognition is over the term of the contracts and what your income statement looks like. And I think it's quite interesting because as we get into more of these videos, you'll see that the measurement uses data that is not data that the insurers necessarily have used in the past. So the operational and system implications are huge around IFRS 17. So what we want to do in this series of, of um, videos is really just break that standard down into bite-sized chunks, reflect on different elements of the standard and hopefully help you as you implement IFRS 17, which is, what are the things I need to think about? So on today's video, what we want to do is start at the beginning. We want to look at what contracts are in scope of this new, new standard and when they might need to be added together or separated out. So IFRS 17, when does it apply, is always the first question I get asked, which is um, it's for periods starting on or after the 1st of January 2021. Now, when I say that, the number of CEOs who say, I'll be retired, um, I, I know that. The reason it is 2021 is this is quite a complex standard and will take time to implement, which is why it's important that companies start looking at it now. Now, it applies to all insurance contracts um, that are issued. And the definition of insurance contract is the same as we have today under IFRS 4. It's where a contract where one company accepts significant insurance risk from another party, who's often called the policyholder, and agrees to compensate them if an adverse future uncertain event occurs. Um, so it's the same definition we have today. Um, it will apply to insurance contracts, reinsurance contracts, and investment contracts with discretionary participation features. I think one thing to note is it doesn't apply to insurance contracts held with the exception of reinsurance, which Gail's just mentioned. So, Gail, does that mean that non-insurers don't need to worry about IFRS 17? <laughs> I'm glad you asked that question. And the answer is no. So, it applies to all insurance contracts, whoever they're written by. But there are some helpful exemptions in the standard. So, initially, we have the same exemptions we have under IFRS 4 today. So, if it's a warranty issued by a manufacturer, dealer or retailer, they are not in the scope of IFRS 17. Similarly, the um, assets and liabilities and pension schemes and contingent consideration for business combination, all those are out of scope of this standard, just as they are out of IFRS 4. But there's one additional uh, change which I think is really important for non-insurers to be aware of, and that's what we call the fixed fee service contracts. Um, and these are contracts that are really sort of, I think of them as maintenance contracts. So I pay someone to come and fix my boiler every time it breaks down or my roadside assistance, uh, where every time I break down, someone comes and rescues my car. And you'll see on the slide, there's certain criteria you need to meet um, to, to get into this, the fixed fee service contracts. But if you do qualify, you have a choice. You can choose to apply the new revenue standard, IFRS 15, rather than IFRS 17. So I think that will be quite helpful for non-insurers. And I think the other thing as well is um, the residual um, value guarantees that you sometimes see in leases or issued by retailers and dealers, those equally are not in the scope of IFRS 17. So that's quite interesting, but 
it, your, the banking world, Sandra, tell us a bit about how you think the standard's going to apply to banks. Yeah, I think the most important thing to note is banks cannot assume this standard doesn't apply to them. If we start with the most obvious category, some banks, particularly bank assurers, have insurance operations within the group. Now, clearly, if you're issuing normal insurance contracts, an IFRS 17 will apply just like it does to an insurer. The next category to think about is financial guarantees. And just like today's gap, with financial guarantees, you have a choice. So if you've previously asserted that those are insurance contracts in the scope of the insurance standard, then that continues under IFRS 17. However, if you've previously accounted for them under the financial instrument standard, then you can carry on doing that. I'm afraid that's not the end of the story. Banks will also have to think about some of the other products the issue. So two examples. Banks may have loans due from customers that are waived in the event the customer dies, so not repayable on death. Now they have an insurance component within them and if that insurance risk is significant, they will fall within the scope of IFRS 17. Another example we see in parts of Europe, banks issue what are called equity release mortgages. These are mortgages granted to older customers um, and typically the mortgage loan is repaid when the customer dies or moves into long-term care. At that point their house is sold, but the amount repaid is capped at the value of the house. So if that's less than the amount due, then the rest is forgiven. Now those two have an insurance component within them and again you'll need to assess if that insurance risk is significant. That will depend on the terms of the loan, things like the loan to value ratio and the loan was first taken out, the age of the borrower, interest rates etc. But if the insurance risk is significant then they too will fall into IFRS 17. One other thing to note about these products, under today's accounting they probably fall into IFRS 4 as well. But under IFRS 4, you have the ability to unbundle them. So to account for the loan element within the financial instrument standard and the insurance element within the insurance standard. Under IFRS 17, the unbundling rules have changed. So it's very unlikely you will be able to unbundle these products. Rather, the whole product will need to be accounted for in IFRS 17. And that will be a big change for many banks. Thanks, Sandra. One of the other things I wanted to mention was the investment contracts with discretionary participation features, or DPF. I haven't got time to explain what those are today. Well, that will be the subject of a future video. But if you do issue those, those would have been under the scope of IFRS 4. Under IFRS 17, they are only in the scope of IFRS 17 if the issuer also issues insurance contracts. So if you don't issue insurance contracts or aren't in an insurance group, you don't have to worry about this standard either. So that's the scope of the standard. We now also need to look at whether we combine or separate insurance contracts before we start looking at how we measure them. The standard talks about if you have two contracts that are issued with the same or related counterparty and they're intended to create some overall commercial effect, then these to be look, need to be looked at together when you're applying IFRS 17. I think where this may apply is when you think about some of the reinsurance fronting arrangements and you particularly see those in group structures, so I would encourage anyone who's got those to have a think about that. But then the more interesting thing is when you separate insurance contracts, and Sandra already alluded to that in the banking products. So you can see on the slide we have three different areas where you have to separate out elements of the contract before you apply IFRS 17. These are embedded derivatives distinct goods and services, and distinct investment components. So Sandra, you're a bit of a guru on embedded derivatives. Thank you, girl. I think that's the closest I've come to a compliment all day. The first thing to note about embedded derivatives is the principles are the same for insurers as they are for anybody else. So the key principle is that if an embedded derivative is closely related to the host contract, then you don't separate it. Similarly, if the feature you're thinking about would not meet the different definition of a derivative, then you don't separate it. And that's nothing changed there. However, there are two specific exemptions for insurance contracts that we need to think about. So the first one is where the embedded derivative is so independent with the insurance element that you can't measure it separately without also considering the insurance component. Now, example there would be an insurance contract with a fixed price payable on surrender. The insurance risk is the surrender risk, and you, they're too interrelated to separate them. The second exemption is where you have an insurance contract where the amount payable is dependent on a price index and the trigger of that payment is itself an insured event. So an example here would be a contract that pays out on the death of the policyholder and the amount paid is linked to an index. And again, that's something that would not be separated. 
But Gail, as you mentioned, it's not only embedded derivatives that need to be separated. So what else do insurers need to think about? Yes, I think the other one to particularly look at is the distinct investment component. And this, you'll have quite a lot of these, particularly in life insurance contracts that have savings components. The standard tells us when it is or isn't distinct. And one of the key things it says is it's not distinct if the, the investment component lapses with the insurance component, or indeed if you can't measure one without the other. And that's actually quite helpful for the life insurers because often they are interdependent and therefore will not be distinct and will not be unbundled. However, as you mentioned, for the banks, that, that is what catches them and they will not be able to unbundle that death cover on the loan that waves on death, which is why the banks will not be able to um, unbundle it. So if you don't meet the distinct criteria, you do not unbundle. I think the other thing for insurers to think about as well is, even when you've taken out the embedded derivatives, the goods and services, and the distinct investment component, you often find different insurance risks bundled together. And some people would call these riders. So I've seen examples where you might have a two-year medical cover um, combined with a 20-year term death cover, and that's one contract. And so the question I know some people are asking is, can I split that out into two different insurance contracts? And actually, the standard is silent on that. So I think that's going to be one of the implementation challenges that we, people will be asking. So today, we've covered the, what contracts are in scope of the standard, when they have to be combined, and when they have to be separated. But clearly, that is just the start of what is a very complex standard. I do hope you'll join and listen to some of our future videos. The next one, we're going to be covering some of the issues that property and casualty insurers should look at. So thank you for watching. Yeah, mute us up. Okay, welcome back. I believe we've taken some insight from that uh, discussion. And at this point, we'll be looking at key terminologies. Immediately, we'll finish with key terminologies. We can now delve in into much more practical engagement. Okay, we've laid the foundation with respect to where we were before, where we are going, and what is changing. Now, we want to look at those critical terminologies that is going to play a significant role in the course of our insurance liability measurement, which we are going into next. Now, there are various key terminologies that will come across. And some of them are like, what is contractual service margin? What is a coverage period? What is fulfillment cash flow? What is financial risk? Uh, what is insurance liability, insurance contract, and the likes. And we're going to look at them critically one by one and try to explain them in a practical form. Okay, we start with contractual service margin. What is a contractual service margin? Okay, a contractual service margin is more or less a component of the kind amount of an asset or liabilities for a group of insurance contracts that represent your own end profits. Now, let me simplify it in a layman's language. Let us assume that a, an insurance company will only take a policy that is profitable. If you take a policy that is profitable and you discover from your measurement that you are going to make such amount or percentage from the premium over time as profit. The collection or the aggregate of those profits on all of those profitable policies at the inception of the contract, which you have forecasted at their present worth, are what we consider as contractual service margin, which means contractual service margin is equivalent of the collection of the on and profits from an insurance coverage, which is also considered in this technical world or language as the liability for coverage period. And we're going to see that now. What that means that rather than you recognizing profit on day one of taking the policy, 
will suspend that profit as a liability. Let's assume that you pick, a, you issue a policy where somebody buy, let me say, an annuity. And that person pay a lump sum amount to buy that annuity now. And that person will be covered over a period of time. And based on your estimation, you have collected a bucket of annuity and you have seen that they are profitable by products. What it then means in that case is that the profit estimated from it as a product will not be recognized. And the only way you will not recognize it as an income or as a profit, as the case may be, is to suspend it. And any income that is so suspended becomes a liability. Because liability, in this case, is the on end portion of the income you have received. And in that light, that is what we consider as the contractual service margin. And that is a bulk of insurance liability, especially for those that are of long term. And when you hear contractual service margin, what should come to your mind and respect is that this is an insurance liability that is solely attributable to the unexpired risk or on end profit from a policy that is still in force. Let us take note of that in a practical sense. And we are going to see that as we move on. The other thing is to look at what is a coverage period. A coverage period is a period to which an insurer still has significant insurance risk he has taken over from the insured. And the coverage period continues to reduce as a result of passage of time. If you buy an annuity from an insurance company for five years, your coverage period at the inception is five years. But as time goes on, two years into the life of that policy, the remaining coverage period will be three years, which means the period to which the insurer has not yet provided the service of coverage to you. Because at that period, you are still under cover, so that in case of any eventualities, you will be in them in fact, based on the contractual terms of that contract. Another perspective is financial risk. And the essence you need to understand this financial risk critically is because you must be able to distinguish, even from the days of IFRS 4, you must be able to distinguish between an insurance risk from a financial risk. Because a financial risk will not be accounted for within the scope of IFRS 17. Rather, only insurances will be accounted for within the scope of IFI 17. And that's why it is critical for you to know what is a financial risk, so that at any point in time, you can distinguish it. Similar to the example you gave, shared the other time with respect to you, Vitor, you will discover that what they have assumed is more of a financial risk than an insurance risk. And by the time we compare them together, you see what we are talking about. Now, what is a financial risk? It's simply the risk of possible future changes in one or more specified market factors. These market factors might entail things like changes in interest rates, changes in financial instrument prices, like equity prices, commodity prices, foreign exchange, volatilities, changes in index, like stock exchange index or indices, changes in rates, credit rating, credit risk, default rate, and etc. All of these market variables, provided in the case of non-financial variable that varies in as a result of situations and time. Now, what it then means is that any form of risk that is to indemnify a third party as a result of market factors are not insurance risk. We must take note of that. Therefore, what is insurance risk? We are going to see that later because it speaks to laws attributable to certain events. 
And what are the events we talk about, like in short event, and they are casterized, and we're going to see that later. Thereafter, we'll talk about fulfillment cash flow. This is so critical. The word fulfillment came from the modification to the contract, uh, uh, conceptual framework in 2018. Remember, under the current value, we said the present value of the future cash flows of a liability are considered as fulfillment value. The word fulfillment has now been characterized with respect to you fulfilling an obligation, which is a liability. Now, the word fulfillment cash flow here comes with the fact that when you collect a premium from an insured, you now assume the responsibility to pay claims as expected or forecasted to those policy orders, which means you must fulfill your obligation. That's what it means. And in doing that, there are also two other secondary factors that come into play. One is a discount rate that takes care of the time value of money. And two is the risk margin that compensates an insurer for taking some level of risk and involvement in some level of activity, which is like a compensation. we we'll call it risk adjustment factor. And we're going to see that as we move on. The collection of these elements, two cash flows, inflow, which is a premium, outflows, which is a claim, including other insurance expenses, discount rates as a factor to bring it to the effect of time value of money, and the risk uh, adjustment factor are the four things that culminate to what we call the fulfillment cash flow. And the result of that is what we consider as a measure of our contractual service margin, which we are going to see. And we're going to see that all because we created a contractual service margin in order to eliminate a day one profit from an insurance policy from a profit making business. And in order to do that, we created the liability to nullify such recognition on day one. And we're going to see that. Now let us look at some other factors. Other factors or other terms that we need to take care of are experience adjustments. That experience adjustment is based on adjustment to your variables, such as cash flows and some other things based on changes in circumstances as reflected based on current situations. You know, Shagun, you make mention of something the other time that what if something predominantly happened and was not expected? Your experience adjustment will take care of that because you are not necessarily God. Therefore, there's a limit to which you can see the future. But as time progresses, you get better feel of what the future holds. And through such an experience, you make necessary adjustments. And in this case, an experience adjustment is a difference between the premium you have received and any other related cash flows, such as insurance acquisition cash flows and insurance premium taxes. Now, what does that mean? You know that when you underwrite a policy, most times you underwrite a policy through a broker or an agent, and they collect their fee. The fee you pay to agent brokers and the likes, including taxes, are certain with it. But in Nigeria, there are no taxes on insurance premium, as the case is. But in some other jurisdiction, there may be. All of these are what are characterized as acquisition costs. And such cost is deductible from the insurance receipt, and that's what it means there. Now, the difference between the net premium receipt, which I'll call insurance receipt, or the, the difference between that and for insurance service expenses. Now, what are the insurance service expenses? One, when there is um, a, a claim and some other, uh, what's it called, expenses you incur in order to, uh, what's it called, um, effect that claim and some other measures which you pay to uh, valuers, adjusters, and some other things, and some element of um, apportionment of the deferred acquisition cost, which you call acquisition cost now, not longer deferred, because now you are not going to defer it, you are going to embed it within the measurement basis of the insurance contract liability. The difference between this will provide you experience adjustment, which you are going to make as necessary 
in your insurance contract liability measurement. But before we move further, let us now ask ourselves a simple question. What then is an insurance contract itself? What is an insurance contract? Because we need to understand that so that any form of a contract, whether embedded or standalone, that does not qualify for insurance contract must be separated from insurance contract for the sole purpose of applying IFI 17. Now, from this perspective, I'll probably see an insurance contract as any form of a contract under which one party, which is the insurer, assets significant insurance risk from another party, which is a policy holder or the insured, by agreeing to compensate the policy holder if they specified on certain future events, which we call the insured event, adversely affect the policy holder. Now, when you look at this, you can say movement in exchange rate adversely affects someone and therefore can take insurance policy on it. You can say movement in interest rates, inflation, or any other market factor will affect top party and therefore can take policy on it. But you get to understand that no, those are market variables. And market variables, any form of policy, whether to derivative or to any other purportedly insurance uh, policy you take on such, will not be termed an insurance contract because it does not necessarily contain an insurance risk. Later on, we'll define what an insurance risk is. Now, but in a layman's language, or to bring it home to everyone, insurance risk talks about you having insurable interest. Now, anything that deals with financial variables, which are considered a financial risk, are not necessarily going to be taken as an insurance risk. Why? Because they are speculative in nature. Okay, which are slightly different from uncertain future events. What are uncertain future events? I'll give you an example. Debt of a policy holder is an uncertain future event. Accident is an uncertain future what? Event where you have insurable interest. Burglary, fire, and similar incidents are insurable events or interest events. Now, in that manner, you must be able to separate it. Anything that bothers on you mitigating financial risk or speculating upon financial risk or anything that deals with microeconomic variable other than the act of God or other than something that comes with nature will not be considered an insurance risk. And once there is no insurance risk, up to the level that such risk is significant and has been assumed by the insurer, such will not constitute an insurance contract. What that means that we must understand that. What if I decide to ensure the life, I take policy on the life of Elon Musk? The question then is, would that constitute an insurance risk? The answer is no. And by regulation, no insurance company will even take that. Because what happens is you have no insurable interest. Who are you to Elon Musk? Do you get what I'm now? Unlike if you take a policy on your spouse, on your parent, on yourself, do you get what I'm now? You have some level of insurance, uh, insurable interest. Do you get what I'm now? Which means that is more or less speculative. And that would not constitute an insurance contract also. Mean that regulatory will any insurance company even underwrite such? Okay, another thing is group of insurance contracts. When we say group of insurance contracts, what do we mean? 
It means a set of insurance contracts resulting from the division of a portfolio of insurance contract into, at a minimum, contract issued within a period of no longer than one year, and that at initial recognition, such contracts are onerous, if any, or have no significant possibility of becoming onerous subsequently, if any, or do not fall into either of A or B, if any. Now, what that simply means is this. Group of insurance contracts are insurance contracts that are group based on one, the time frame. And the time frame means that every policy issued in 2021 are likely to qualify into a similar group. But apart from timing factor, which must not be more than one year, you must also consider that those policies are policies that are considered profitable. Profitable in the sense that they are not onerous and they are not likely going to be onerous. But furthermore to that uh, uh, description, you must also look at other variables that are unique in order to create a group, which you call a cohort. And what are the other factors? For example, policies underwritten. Let me say life policies underwritten in this year, you can divide them into, is it endowment, is it term, is it old life, and all sorts of things. Also, you can more or less group them based on other homogeneous factor. As the case may be, in a manner in which you want to manage the portfolios of such an insurance policy. And therefore, the grouping of insurance contracts is critical to insurance liability measurements because such measurements will be carried out on the basis of courts. Court is the grouping of insurance liability with homogeneous factors, factors that are common to those policies under that group. Which then implies that invariably, your portfolio of insurance can constitute as much as tens, hundreds, or even thousands of courts. Court means grouping of insurance policy along timing and along other factors or variables. And that is why the role of IT is significant to it. Because unlike before, that the level of grouping is so limited. Now, the level of grouping now, though it's not unlimited, but it's going to be widely dispersed, depending on the nature of that insurance company and the kind of business it underwrites and the demographics and distribution of the policy holders. And therefore, that has to be taken into consideration. Okay, we'll see some basis to which we we'll use to more or less group businesses. Yes, sir. You group businesses based on nature, based on time, and based on other factors, as the case may be. For example, for a life policy, you can group based on age, you can group based on type of policies, and you can also group based on the timing. But again, timing is a common factor to all because any form of policy in a single group must fall within the same time that is not one year, uh, uh, one year um, away from one another. Okay. Another thing we also need to consider here is insurance acquisition cash flows. Now, these are cash flows arising from the cost of selling, underwriting, and starting a group of insurance contract issued or expected to be issued that are directly attributable to the portfolio of insurance contract to which the group belongs. Such, uh, such cash flows include cash flows that are not directly attributable to individual contract or group of shared contract within the portfolio. Okay, I remember we've discussed what acquisition cost is. An acquisition cost is such that you incur it in order to underwrite a policy. And it's usually attributed to the amount you pay as commission or otherwise to insurance brokers, insurance agents, and the likes. 
Okay. Now, insurance contract with direct participation features, I think we'll discuss extensively with that. And it can be defined as an insurance contract that is not an insurance contract with direct participation features. Which means it's either in today's world, your insurance contract is having discretionary participation features or it's form of investment contract with discretionary participation features. But whenever you have insurance contract without direct participation features, it means this insurance contract is just a pure insurance contract that only speaks to the underwriting. It doesn't speak to whether you have the right to participate in the profit or any other form of return underlining the insurance business as a whole. Therefore, as opposed to insurance contract with direct participation features, this is without, which means most insurance contracts by definition are without direct participation features. But anyone with direct participation features will clearly be defined at every point in time in the contract. Okay, insurance contract with participation features now. These are insurance contracts for which at exception, the following conditions apply. One, the contractual terms specified by the policyholder participates in a share of a clearly identified pool of underlying items. Two, the entity expects to pay the policyholder an amount equal to the substantial share of the fair value return on the underlying item. And three, the entity expects a substantial proportion of any changes in the amount to be paid to the policyholder to vary with the changes in the fair value of the underlying item. Therefore, when you have this situation, it's considered as an insurance contract that carries along with it or embedded with it a direct participation features in any form of return that is clearly stated and identified at the inception of the contract. Now let's also now look at insurance contract services. Okay, insurance contract services varies in nature and is a collection of various things that come up as a result of an insurer rendering a service to the policy order or to the insured. Now, the following services that an entity provides to policy order of an insurance contract include the following. One, coverage for an insured event. That is the primary responsibility of an underwriter. Why did I issue this policy to you? And why did I decide to underwrite this policy? Is because I want to provide you with cover. And that is primary. The second thing is that you can also provide services with respect to insurance contract without direct participation features. The generation of investor return for the policy order, if applicable. And also, you can also provide insurance contract service that contain a direct participation features including those that might contain investment-related services. And that's how I've explained to us that you must take note of it that you can have a pure coverage and you can have a coverage that provides return, but not necessarily directly related, which might be discretionary. And the one that is not discretionary, but you must, based on the terms and conditions, as at the time the policy is underwritten, and that is those that contain direct participation features. Now let's now look at insurance risk. And we'll now see the clear difference between insurance risk and the financial risk. Listen, insurance risk is defined with reference to financial risk and is defined as thus. It says risk other than financial risk that has been transferred by a policy holder or by an insured of a contract to the insurer. Now, what does that mean? It means once you take away every form of speculative risk, gambling, uh, financial risk, variables, and all sorts of things, anything left will be attributed to nature or circumstances that depend on certain future events. And that's why I've said earlier from the angle of financial risk that 
if you are taking any risk that you are trying to transfer risk or avoid risk that is associated with market variables or macroeconomic variables or financial variables, those are never, regardless of who on the right search, those will never be considered as an insurance risk. That is why the standard IFRS 4 and equally, the newest standard, IFRS 17, defines insurance risk from the perspective of the negation of financial risk. Which means once you are able to eliminate all form of financial risk, any other risk left that you have now taken a policy on will be tantamount to an insurance risk. Now, what is an insured event? Any uncertain future event covered by insurance contract that creates an insurance risk is considered an insured event. And if you extend on this, this borders on perils and hazard. And that's why when you now narrow into perils and hazard, we are talking about accidents, deaths, burglary, thefts, fire, and any other form of on certain events that are less likely expected if certain things have been put in, what, in place. And of which the crystallization of such is always attributed to act of God or act of man. Act of God is something you cannot prevent like death. Act of man is things that you can prevent by human, but the human have been negligent by way of one by one way or the other that has caused accident or an injury at a point in time. Now, investment component is always a component associated with an insurance contract that carries a form of investment returns. Now, when we look at this, we said the amount that an insurance contract requires the entity to repay to a policyholder in all circumstances, regardless of whether an insured event occurred. And that's why today, IFRS 7 has said, you must separate your deposit components from your insurance components. Most policies, life policies in Nigeria today, have significant components that are investments. And therefore, they will no longer account for that as revenue. They will account for that as deposit liability, similar to what bank account for. Because when you deposit money in bank, whether by demand deposit or tenor deposit or whatever medium, they take it as purely liability in their books, with the call deposit liability. Similar thing will happen to insurance company. It's only the components that is related to insurance risk that will have to be measured in line with IFRS 17, which we are going to get to in module three, where we will start to measure the fulfillment cash flow, the CSM, which is a contractual service margin, and I will recognize those things over time as insurance revenue and insurance service experts. Okay. Which that means that the amount that an insurance company requires the entity to pay to a policyholder in all circumstances, regardless of whether an insured event or call, are considered investment components. Who is a policyholder? A policyholder is the insured. The policyholder is usually a party that has a right to compensation under an insurance contract if an insured event does occur. Okay, now let's look at portfolio of insurance contracts. Now, the portfolio of insurance contracts, insurance contracts that are subject to similar risk and managed together will be considered portfolio of an insurance contract. That's why I've said, by way of court, you have series of portfolios of insurance contracts. Also, reinsurance contracts, as we have explained in our module one, we we'll find out that insurance contract is always attributed to ceiling of insurance risk that has primarily been assumed 
by an insurer prior to now. And from the definition from the standard, it's spelled out that an insurance contract issued by one entity, the insurer, to compensate another entity for claims arising from one or more insurance contract issued by the other entity is considered to be a reinsurance contract. Now, we mentioned underlining item when we're discussing on direct participation features, wherever we have insurance contracts that contain or is with a direct participation features, we we'll talk about underlining item to which it serves as a reference point in which return that is guaranteed is made to the policy holder. Now, in this case, the standard define underlining items as follows. Items that determine some of the amount payable to the policy holder. Underlining items can comprise any item. For example, it can be a reference portfolio of assets, it can be net asset of the entity, which is the insurance company itself, or a specified subset of the net asset of the entity. But this will have been predetermined at the inception of the contract based on the contractual arrangement between the policy holder and the issuer in this case. Now, we also look at risk adjustment for non-financial risk. Now, in the measurement of insurance liability, risk adjustment factor is required to capture things that are not associated with financial risk, which represent a compensation to the insurance company. And what is this? A risk adjustment for non-financial risk represents the comp compensation an entity requires for bearing the uncertainty about the amount and the timing of cash flow that arises from non-financial risk as the entity fulfills its insurance contract. Now, what does that mean? Which means any risk not associated with changes in discount rates, changes in market variables, but the risk is associated with the variability in the cash flow or the time when the cash flow will occur. Let me give you a practical example. In your forecasting at the inception of the of the uh, what's it called of the contracts, you estimate that claims are likely going to happen at so so time. But unfortunately, the claim did not happen so sooner, but rather happen later. At the end of the day, you gain more because the effect of time value of money will have compensated you for later claims. Another perspective to it is that you estimated claim to be 1 million. But eventually, when the claim arises, the claim was no more than 800,000. Therefore, this is an additional compensation not associated with financial variables that serve as benefit to the insurance company. And we're going to see the practical demonstration of that as we move on. Okay, to wrap it up, let us look at the liabilities. Insurance contract liabilities can be divided into two. The first one is liability for insured claims. We are familiar with this, but most of us are not familiar with the second. And the second is a significant component of the insurance liability, especially for long-term contract. And what is that? The liability for remaining coverage. And that liability for remaining coverage is somewhat embedded in the CSM, which is called the contractual service margin, and we're going to get to that level. But let's break it down further. Liability for incurred claims are liability relating to claims that have been made by the policy holder, but of which settlement has not been made. For example, as at the reporting date, certain claim has been made, but those claims have not been settled because one, it has not been finalized, Two is in the process of being finalized. Three, it has been finalized, but as a reporting date, cash flow has not been parted with it. All of this will constitute liability for each 
secured claims. And the standard consider it as follows. An entity's obligation to A, investigate and pay valid claim for insured events that have already occurred, including events that have occurred, but of which claims have not been reported, and other incurred insurance expenses. And two, pay amount that are not included in A, and they relate to either of the following insurance contract services that have already been provided, such as loss adjusters, uh, services rendered of which payment has not been made, any investment component or other amount that are not related to the provision of insurance contract services that are not in the liability for remaining coverage, especially if such investment components are of short term or their maturity is falling below one year. All of this will constitute a liability for incurred claims. Alternatively, a liability for remaining coverage is the liability that is synonymous to the unexpired risk, which means the coverage that the service has not yet been provided by way of passage of time. And the standard defines this as follows. It says that a liability for remaining coverage for an entity is so that an entity's obligation to do the following. One, investigate and pay valid claim under existing insurance contracts, which means existing means unexpired risk, insurance risk contracts, for insured events that have not yet occurred, that is obligation that relates to the unexpired portion of the insurance coverage. And two, pay amount under existing insurance contracts that are not included in the first mention, and they relate to the following. Insurance contract services not yet provided, that is the obligation that relates to future provision of insurance contract services, or any investment component or other amount that are not related to the provision of insurance contract services and that have not been transferred to the liability of incurred claim. They have not been transferred to liability of incurred claim solely because they are deposit components or deposit contract liability that are above one year, which constitutes remaining coverage, unlike those that are below one year, which might have been reported within the incurred claim aspect. Okay, these are all the critical terms as defined by IFRS 17, and they play a pivotal role in the module three and module four we are going into where measurements, series of measurements will be carried out in line with the provision of the standards. Now on this basis, if there are any other questions, contribution, clarification or deliberation, the floor is open. The floor is open. Any question? Any contribution? Yes, I have uh, two questions, sir. Okay. I have two questions and uh, we've talked about um, insurance contract with direct uh, participatory futures and those without direct participatory futures. But there's something I observed in my little insurance experience in Nigeria. I didn't do a lot of them. And I was still a very, very young uh, auditor as of then. So I didn't do a lot of work on insurance. But I realized that, especially in life insurance, you can have an insurance policy that extends for a number of years. And the insurance company will also give you loan. And you use your policy without insurance company as the collateral. So I want to know. This is what I observe. I don't know if it's still in place, but how do we treat that? Do we have to separate the two? Do we commingle? But I just wanted to speak to this for me. And um, the second, can you repeat the last phrase? So what's the nature of the contract? Okay, the nature of the contract is that you have an insurance 
policy with an insurance company, mostly life insurance for a long period of time. And whenever you need the money as a policy holder, you can also apply for loan from the same insurance company. And that company uses your policy as collateral for the loan they are issuing to you. And uh, my second question is borders on uh, scope. I'm sorry to take us a little bit backwards. Now, my as we are talking, I was just imagining a situation. Let's say all these uh, applications, mobile app or uh, marketplace mobile app, where you have a platform that people can buy and trade commodities. And within that, within the contract you have with the user, is that whenever good do not meet the specification or the supplier fail to supply to the standard that you expected. If that supplier refuses to reimburse or indemnify the buyer, the owner of that uh, platform will have to take it up. It's a matter of contract that that person that holds the platform, we have to like indemnify the buyer for whatever loss sustained. So I can see that this, this is an insurance risk because it is adverse to the buyer if the supplier did not supply. And also it is, it is a risk to the, to, to the owner of the platform. So I want to know, based on everything you've explained, does this also fit in into an insurance contract that IFRS 17 can be applied upon? Okay, let me start with the first one. The first one deals with situation where you have a policy. I can use that policy as a securitization for loan. Okay, now the first thing you need to understand is that there are two separate transactions. You've taken the policy separately. At a future date, you are using that policy or that policy qualify you to use it as a security for loan. There are two transactions. And we must first of all get it clearly in that perspective. Now, what you do in that situation is that the policy itself will have to be viewed on the standalone to see whether it qualifies as an insurance contract. And from the reference you made in Nigerian context, those policies qualify as insurance contracts. But those policies mostly contain deposit components or what we call the investment components. And with that means that in that light, the policy itself have to be split into insurance contract components and investment contract components and accounted for appropriately. You understand? Because the reason why it is allowed for collateral is because the insurance company understand that there's a deposit component that serves as a savings that you have made over time. And that's why they are, pledged, they are allowing it to be pledged as a collateral for your policyholder loans. You can say now, what that means that the only thing you need to understand is policyholder loan is a separate transaction which qualify as financial instrument. Why the contract itself, the policy contract has two components in it, insurance contract components, and the investment contract component, and they have to be separated and accounted for appropriately. The insurance contract component will be accounted for under FI 17. Deposit component will be accounted for under FI 9. And that speaks to it. The other one you said with respect to providing a platform to which buyers and sellers meet, and the uh, platform provider assumes some level of risk on behalf. When you look at it critically, is a form of financial risk um, measures or protections, or I'll see it as a form of um, guarantee. You understand? It's not, it's not, you know, if you go back to the scoop, we talk about that some things are scooped out. Some financial guarantee are scooped out of RFI 17 because they are not issued by an insurer. Do you get what I'm saying now? In this case, when you look at this kind of situation you portray for somebody that provides app as a platform for buyer and seller, and it provides that form of guarantee, is a form of financial guarantee that falls within the scope of IFRS 9. And it should be accounted for in that light, not under IFRS 17. 
Okay, so you said something that because they are not provided by an insurer. But so what I understand from the definition is that this IFRS 17 relates to insurance contract and not necessarily insurance company. Yes. So, so if it meets the definition of insurance contracts, why can't we use IFRS 17? It doesn't meet the definition of an insurance contract because there is no insurance risk as defined. Remember, what we call insurance risk, if I put your attention back, is from the perspective of negating a financial risk. What is the risk that the owner of the platform is trying to protect? He's trying to protect his own risk because he's the one bringing the two people together for that transaction. You can say now. The owner of the platform is serving as an insurer now. The person that is trying to protect risk is the buyer. And that is the risk of possibly losing his money and not getting the product in return. And that's what, that's what I'm trying to say that is providing, okay, what's the difference between that and when a bank tells you to bring a guarantee? Is financial guarantee an insurance contract? No. No. That's why if you go back to financial risk, we say financial risk are risk associated with market variables. What about if you buy credit default swap? They are like uh, credit insurance, but they are not insurance in principle, they are financial products. Now, let's go back here. Can you read financial risk? Okay, just a moment. The risk of a possible future change in one or more of a specified interest rates, financial instrument price, commodity price, currency exchange rate, index of prices or rates, credit rating or credit index or other variable, provided in the case of a non-financial variable that the variable is not specific to a party to the contract. How is it specific to, uh, what's it called? Um, hmm. Now I, get, now I get it. It is not specific. It is not. The problem of the app is, you know, that he has built his own, uh, what's it called, uh, uh, his own return. That's why he's assuming that financial risk of default by any of the person. Do you get what I'm saying now? Yes. I get what I'm saying now. Yes. That's why every form of credit default swap and also of swaps or credit insurance taken are not necessarily insurance contracts. They are majorly financial contracts, even though it might be underwritten by an insurance company. Yeah. Because you find out that it's coming in between two parties, having dealing with one another, trying to protect them against one another. You can say now, yes. and that's why insurance contract uh, insurance risk was never defined on the standalone. Because if you attempt to define insurance risk on the standalone, you find yourself in a situation where something might fall into the two, and it will be difficult to distinguish. Are you getting this? Yes, sir. Miss Amu. You are muted. Okay, okay, okay. I just want to um, come up from where Shego uh, was trying to, you know, distinguish between those things. And I want to get your, uh, uh, I want you to, you know, clarify this. I'm thinking that, uh, is it possible to conclude that most times uh, all of these insurance risk will only have a downside risk? Because all, most of these financial risk and financial contracts, they always come with upside and downside most times. But insurance is only for downside risk because there cannot be upside on insurance contract. Is that a reasonable conclu uh, to conclude? To some extent, or to a large extent, it is a reasonable conclusion, but it goes beyond that also. But to a large extent, is a reasonable conclusion. So my Thank conclusion you. You. with this is just that 
one of the major important aspects of accounting for insurance is to be very, very uh, accurate on the scope, whether the transaction meets this, uh, uh, this insurance standard or not. I think that is also very, very important because there are different transactions and what must be examined is whether or not it qualifies to be reported under yes. IFR 17. Yes, that is why you find out that we spend a lot of time trying to diversify this. You know, uh, the worst thing in life that will happen to a man that is ill is a wrong diagnosis. That's the worst thing that can happen to you. It's not poor treatment, but wrong diagnosis. You have typhoid, but they diagnose it as malaria. And for years, you have been treated for malaria until the typhoid has gotten to a level of no return before they realized, and that's the end of the man. The same thing happens to scope in and scope out. No matter the beauty of what you do, once you have wrongly applied a standard to a transaction that does not qualify, you've messed up everything. And that's why before you delve into any standard, you must identify, is it within the scope or not? And that's why when you see here, first, anyone, any form of insurance or warranty or anything you call it that is issued by the same manufacturer or dealer or retailer of a particular product or services can never qualify as an insurance company. Two, when you have a form of financial guarantee contracts, especially those that are issued by a party that is not a party to the contracts, you know, you are just on one side, two people are dealing with one another and you come in between them to guarantee one party or the other. You are coming there to speculate or to arbitrage or to do whatever you want to do. I get what I'm saying now. And that is what we need to take into consideration. Tosin, you are trying to make one conclusion again. Over to you. No, no, no. I think uh, you have um, answered that, that at least to a large extent, it might be reasonable, but it's more than that. I'll, maybe you can just share one or two examples. I'm just trying to look at it because, I mean, most of these contracts, you know, you always see, but insurance is always catering for you know, whatever could go wrong. But you know, when you're speculating, you're either speculating for hope, you're speculating for that, it could go either way. So I'm trying to look at it. Maybe if you look at it from that lens, we can easily be able to distinguish uh, all of these insurance contracts because it's very critical for us to be able to understand that these are an insurance contract before we apply even an FRA 17 to it. Yeah, thank you. That's why I make one example, one critical example about Elon Musk. Imagine you are a shareholder in Tesla. And because Elon Musk is critical to Tesla, the illness or death of Elon Musk will cause you a financial loss. Therefore, you decide to underwrite a policy. You try to take a policy, not underwrite. You try to take a policy from whether insurance company or any other person, but less likely an insurance company because they will not, by regulation, they will not underwrite such policy because of insurable interest clause. But you approach any, any company or even an insurance if it's permitted in that jurisdiction to uh, undertake a policy on the life of Elon Musk in order to protect your investment. Such a policy is not an insurance contract, even though it's a downside because of what? You have no insurable interest. You can see now, the interest you have in Elon Musk is common and generic to everybody that is a shareholder. Or like the interest you have to, or the interest you have to, you can see now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Which that means that even though you have right to, you have right to, even though you are right to the highest degree with respect to a downside, but not all downside also give rise to insurance. 
which is the Elon Musk case I've given to you. Because any debt or index of Elon Musk, no matter the theory you want to postulate in investment community, the shares of Tesla will crash. And in that light, you've suffered a loss. But the loss is not unique to you. Unlike loss arising from accidents or death of your parents or death of somebody that you have insurable interest in or theft of your property and some other things like that. But anything on Elon Musk is generic and is uh, not unique to you. It's going to affect virtually millions of people like you. And in that case, you have no insurable interest. And in that case, there's no insurance risk that is being underwritten. Rather, you might have taken a policy on a financial risk, which will no longer qualify as an insurance contract. I think I'm clear, Tosin. Very clear, very clear. Thank you. OK. OK, now we are moving to module three, where we start to do the job. Even though we are starting to do the job, but most of the job will be made easier because of what we have done so far. And now we want to look at the approaches to insurance liability measurements. I don't know whether it's coincidental, but I want somebody to answer. How many approaches do we have to insurance contract liability measurements under IFI 17? Do we answer that? How many approaches? Uh, based on what you said earlier, we have three approaches. Okay, and that's what I said, probably it's coincidental because three two approaches. Is the, <laughs> the answer is staying on our faces. Three. <laughs> okay, who can mention those three before we go into the full discussion? Um, I can't remember the second one, but I know the first one is a general. Okay, wait, wait. What I'll do is that can all of you send me a private chat by measuring the three? Private chats in one minute. Okay. Now, there are three approaches. The first approach is the general measurement model, which is called the GMM. Why? Because in trying to explain the general measurement model, we make use of the reference to a model that forms like a building block. When I say building block, it's like when you are building, probably people in UK, no, UK is okay. US will not understand building block because it's only the extreme people that use block in the U US, okay? But people in Nigeria understand block better. Probably in France also you understand blocks where you lay blocks upon blocks in order to build a structure. Now that, that's why some people also call it building block approach. Whether you hear general measurement model or you hear building block approach, they mean the same thing. And this model is the foundation or the default model 
for Shah's liability measurement. Every other model are secondary model. Now, but something very close to the general model is a variable field approach. And is a modified general measurement model or modified building block approach. And this model is only applicable extensively where you have insurance contract with direct participation features. And it's an option that can be adopted. Which means you can still go with your general model, but as an option, you'll we'll use this. But if you have insurance contract that does not contain that features, you cannot make use of this VFA. You must compulsively make use of GMM. Furthermore, GMM may not be adopted for insurance contracts that does not have coverage beyond one year. And this is common to short-term life policies. Short-term life policies might be like travel policies. You know, you are traveling abroad, you are taking travel insurance for the purpose of medical and death, accident or anything. It also covers much more of non-life policies like general insurance, where you underwrite car policies, maritime insurance, for transporting of goods um, and other form of burglary, fire, thefts that are not usually more than one year policy underwritten. Therefore, you make use of what we call as an alternative, not compulsory, a simplified approach, which we call a premium allocation approach. Okay, this is just a summary. Now let's look at it and emphasize it the way the standard portrayed them. As I said earlier, the general measurement model or GMM or BBA, which is a building block approach, is a default measurement model for insurance contract and will be used to measure insurance contract without direct participation features or product that fail to meet the VFA or PAA eligibility requirements. Okay, VFA, as I've said earlier, is mandatory to use for contracts with direct participation features that meet the specific VFA eligibility requirements. I will come back to this. What are the VFA eligibility requirements? I think no, for contracts with direct participation features that do not meet this eligibility requirement, VFA cannot be applied. And instead, you will compulsorily apply GMM. This is what I've explained earlier. Likewise, the premium allocation approach, which is a PAA, is only intended for practical expedient purposes which is a simplified approach, which will only be applicable in a situation where, one, you have a short-term contract that is not more than one year policy coverage period. Or you may apply it to a long-term contract that the use of that PAA will produce result that is not materially different from what GMM will have produced. But in such an instance, it's highly rebootable because it might not be necessarily applicable for a long-term contract because um, probably over time experience will show, but from the little I know, except if the longevity of the long-term contract is not that much, probably two years, three years, in most instances, I believe 
that the PAA will not be a good approximation for GMM for a long-term contract other than short-term contract of one year below. Now, let's now go granular with the defaults, which is the GMM. Now, the characteristics of the GMM are as follows. And I believe since we are familiar with the terminologies, with the background, with what we try to address, we'll have a better understanding of this. Now, what is this? One, the GMM is a standardized approach. It's a uniform approach that is applicable for every situation you might come across. That's number one. Number two, the GMM, you calculate it by discounting the expected cash flows and considering the risk adjustments associated with the policy, thereby producing a profit that cannot be recognized as the one, rather the profit will be suspended as a liability under the philosophy of the CSM, which is a contractual service margin. Whereas if you experience a loss, such a loss will be recognized immediately, unlike profit that is suspended, which speaks to the prudence concept that we all know. Three, a certain loss on errors contract need to go directly to your profit or loss, which I've also explained. Which means profit, you are cautious in recognizing profit, but you are, you are more or less, uh, you are more or less quick to recognizing losses, but you are careful in recognizing profit and you recognize that profit over time based on services provided by the insurer. The fourth situation here is that every year you are to update your assumptions and the amount of expected cash flows, the risk adjustment, CSM, and any loss components, which speaks to the fact that your liability should be a representation of the current measurement model, which speaks to the current value at the measurement basis under the conceptual framework of the IESB as issued in March 2018. The fifth position here is that positive or negative changes can go through CSM, profit or loss, or can eat the own fund directly. What does that mean? Based on the methodologies and the accounting policies as time goes on, you find out that the movement, whether increase or decrease, in your insurance liability might impact your contractual service margin, thereby suspending the recognition, usually if it's profit, or impact your profit or loss, usually if it is deficit, which is a loss or onerous position, or suspended through the recognition in other component of equity to other comprehensive income. That only applies to the VFA, okay, which are going to see much more because of the direct participation features and its eligibility. Another position there is that once we deliver the insurance service, you try to recognize a component of your CSM as your profit in your financial statement. Which means CSM is the unrecognized profit or an end profit over the remaining uh, period. And what then do we do is that at every point in time, we recognize a component of it or a portion of it as profit based on the fact that service, insurance services are being rendered by the policy order, uh, by the issuer, policy issuer. Lastly, on no basis, whatsoever reason, under this methodology or any other methodology, can there be recognition of profits 
at the inception of a contract, no matter how superfluous that profit might be. At inception of an insurance contract, no day one profit can be recognized. Does that make sense? Now, to further make sense, let me now provide you the pictorial representation of how we determine that. I will go into the modeling as time goes on. Remember, we said insurance contract liability is made up of liability for remaining coverage and liability for incurred claims. Okay, now, what is the liability for remaining coverage? Okay, let me start from the simpler liability that you all know. Liability for incurred claims are very straightforward. It's simply the cash outflow. Claims have been made or claims have been reported but have not been paid or claims have been underreported but when we say increase in the liability, our claims have not have been incurred but not reported. And we have estimate of that based on past experience. All of this cash flows, once we estimate our payouts, discounting may apply and may not apply depending on the time frame. If the time frame is very short, discounting is insignificant and it may not apply. But if the time frame of the claim will be long, because there are some nature of claim that will take year or years. For example, plane crash, claim will take not one year. It might be up to two years because of certain investigation, uh, autopsy, this, that, and some clearance and some other complexities. Therefore, in such situation, discounting may apply because this can, effect of discounting starts from a year and above. But again, if it might be material, which is not necessarily so for any period below one year, you might also consider that as an accounting policy option. Once you discount that with some level of risk adjustment to the variability in the cash flows, which might serve as a compensation for the insurer, what you get from that, is going to give you what we call the liability for insured claims. And that is a fulfillment cash flow for claims that has occurred, but of which settlement has not been made for one reason or the other. But the one that is more critical is the liability for remaining coverage. Liability for remaining coverage is with respect to coverage beyond what you can see, which is for the remaining life of the policy. You must be able to project capital into the future. And not only that, it also contains element of the profit that you are yet to recognize, which is associated with the future services you will provide over the remaining coverage period, which we call the contractual service margin. The accumulation of this and this is what produces the liability for the remaining coverage. And by the time we get to the practical level, we will see how we demonstrate that one by one. Now, any question before I move further in this discussion? because I provided guidance on the GMM or the building block approach. Any guidance on that or any question on that so that I can take you through before we get to the measurement side and you see it clearly. Now, there's nothing unique at the fulfillment cash flow year except for this contractual service margin. And that's where the key work is, which is modified. But before then, we are going to prepare the ground to solving bulk of the problem in modified 
by having some level of discussion at this level. Any other question? Hello, sir. Yes, Mr. Dari. Sorry to bother you, sir. My internet has been so bad. Please, can you recap on the GMM and just brief explanation? Sorry to take you back. Okay. Now, first, to allay your fears, you have access to the recording so that okay. that allays your fears first. Second, is that I'm going to try to repeat, but in a fast approach because of the time limitation. We said the GMM is a default methodology. That is, it is a primary model that solves all of the problems. And the model is standardized in nature. And two, the model considers expectation regarding your cash flows, both premium and uh, cash claims, uh, uh, claims, risk adjustment, and the discounting of them. And what it says is that the remaining element of it is either going to produce a profit or a loss. The profit is what we consider as CSM, which is a contractual service margin. But the loss is the loss, which will be recognized on day one. But the profit will be suspended on day one. Two, when we have a loss, we say such a contract is onerous. It is onerous because the benefit of fulfilling the contract is being outweighed by the cost of fulfilling that contract would bring us to a lost position. And in that case, such a lost position is recognized immediately based on our prudent concepts. Again, we said every year, you must update these assumptions that underlines your measurement of liability in order to know that your liability is a reflection of the current measurement value. Also, we said, the measurement could bring about positive changes or negative changes. The positive changes will not be recognized immediately because it's more or less normal to recognizing profit earlier than necessary. Therefore, that will be adjusted through your unrecognized uh, profit, which is your CSM. And if it's a loss, short loss, which is negative changes will be recognized in profit or loss immediately. And in some extent or situation where there are some more changes in the discount rate that brings about changes in this value, by way of accounting policy, usually common under the VFA, that may be reported through other component of equity, which is other comprehensive income. Also, we said once we deliver insurance service, as times go by, which is a passage of time you start to release portion of this unrecognized profit, which is CSM, into your profit or loss on a systematic basis. And we're going to demonstrate that later on. And we also said at no point in any of the methodology, including GMM, will the one profit be recognized at the inception of an insurance contract. And on that premise, we'll try to display it mathematically by saying that before now, we have said the chance liability is of two folds. Those that have crystallized, but payment has not been made or settlement has not been reached. And those that are yet to crystallize, but to emphasize will crystallize, out of which it has been measured, plus the element of the profit that has not yet been earned, but relate to future service insurance contracts. All of this is what constitutes liability for remaining coverage, which is for the unexpired risk, and liability for the incurred claims, which is for the expired risk of which settlement has not taken place. Does that provide you some cues? Please, I have a question, sir. Yes, okay. On liability yes, for incurred yes, claims. So I think you mentioned three categories of liabilities that should be uh provided for 
under this liability for incurred claims. But there's one that is striking, which I don't understand because I'm not an insurance expert. You said that uh, claims, or you said it insured event that have occurred but has not been reported. So how will the insurance company know that something has occurred? when it has not been reported, and how do we know the amount that we will book for this? Okay, uh, first, let me break it down like this. There are three categories of uh, incurred claims. Incurred claims that have been finalized, agreed amounts, but you have not yet settled. Probably you are still processing the settlement and also of things. And as at the important date, you have not paid, and therefore it's still a liability. There's an insurance, insurance claim that has been incurred, but not reported. That is the insured event has occurred. But our experience and practice has shown to us that sometimes two months after the year end, three months, we are getting claim of last year which when we investigated, we know that they actually happened, but they have not reported it. I'll give you an example. My wife's car had small accident, but it's over three months now, and I've still not reported it. But I know that any time I report it, it's for them to establish it and they will do it. And it has happened severally, because I've not had time to send pictures, to you know all sorts of documentary so i don't have time now therefore how do you now estimate that since you are not a spirit or god similarly how do you as a manufacturer of a product make provision for defects in your products in line with is 37 you use experience Hmm. historical data, current condition to estimate that over the last 10 years, you have record of claims that were reported months, months after. Therefore, you build what we call a claim matrix. And from that matrix, you can be able to more or less estimate what proportion of your own expired risk that we have occurred of which the claim were not reported. And that's what we call IBNR, incurred but not reported. Incurred but not what? Reported. reported. IBNR. Okay. There's now the last one, which we barely do in Nigeria, but it's common in the EU. IBNER. IBNER is incurred, but not enough reported. What does that mean? Incurred, but not enough reported means that the claim has been reported, but the severity of it may not have been appropriately reported. And I'll give you an example. There is um, a G wagon of someone that had an accident, it's a serious accident. And the Jew wagon was driven to a mechanic, professional mechanic. And because of, it took a month to check everything. And they came up with an estimate to the insurance company. But there's a caveat there that, take note to, because of the sensitivity of G Wagon and because it's Benz, things that we are able to estimate now are things that are obvious, that are seen, feasible, but there are some inherent things in the future as a result of not even driving a Benz that might come up in future, that is before they finish the repair, that even when you finish the repair of physical attributes, some things might go affected because of not driving it for some time, because of some impact that is not yet visible. With them is that the insurance company will take note of that and say, okay, no, they're giving us a bill of 15 million. But this 15 million is for visible things 
the likelihood that there might be invisible items that may cost another five million based on experience. Therefore, it then means that though 50 million has been reported as claim, but that 50 million is not enough. To make it enough, there's a likelihood of incurring additional five million. Do you can say now? That one will not fall under the IBNER. What I might likely do also is, um, let me try and, let me try and um, show you something online. IBNR. And IBNR so that you can have better understanding. Okay, can you read it up first? Okay, sir. Incurred but not reported, IBNR, is a type of reserve account used in the insurance industry as a provision for claims and or events that have expired, but have not yet been reported to an insurance company. To an actuary, these types of events and losses are said to have been incurred but not reported. Okay. Yeah, can you read this? Can you read this? Okay. Incured but not report. Okay. IBNR calculation. Incured but not reported. Ultimate loss paid minus paid loss minus case reserves. And that case reserve are known. Okay, IBNR equals to ultimate loss minus paid reserve minus case reserves. And that case reserves are known. An estimate of IBNR can be made if a reasonable estimate of ultimate loss and paid loss is available. Okay. Is it's IBNR an accrual? Yeah. We consistently apply an high IBNR estimate methodology from period to period. Our IBNR best estimate is made of an act of an accrual basis and adjusted in future periods as required. Any adjustments to the prior period estimates are included in the current period. Okay, let's now look at IBNR. Okay, IBNR, which is the ab abbreviation form for incurred but not enough reported results. Are the claim application made wherein the losses have been reported but not adequately? Description, for a given period, occurrence of any event insured under an insurance contract leads to claims becoming due for the company. Now what's the difference? What is the difference between IBNR and IBNER? Pure IBNR refer to only unreported claims. Oh, scroll down, please. I mean, scroll up, sorry. Pure IBNR refers to, an, to only unreported claims, not any development or not any development on reported claims. Incured but not enough reported in contracts, in contrast, refers to development on reported claims. Let's look at what is case reserve in insurance. What are case reserves insurance? A case reserve is an estimate of the amount for which 
a particular claim will ultimately be settled or adjudicated. Insurers will also set results for their entire books of business to estimate their future liabilities. Okay, now for insurance claim that takes longer tail or longer time to settle because of reporting and some other things, what do you consider it to be? Can you read this up? Okay, what is a latent claim? A latent claim is a type of long tail liability where there is a time lag between occurrence and manifestation of injury or damage. They are associated with problems that take a long time to develop and are caused by gradual processes such as pollution and asbestos. Okay. Okay. I think that has addressed some of our, our concerns. Okay. Now let's now look at VFE. Now, VFA is a measurement model mandated for contrast to direct participation features. Please, you've not switched to your screen, sir. Okay. VFA is a measurement model mandated for contrast with direct participation features that meet the specific VFA eligible requirements. And these are insurance that are substantially investment related service contract under which an entity promise an investment return based on underlining item. Now, take note to be classified as VFA eligible, a contract must meet the following set criteria. Now, look at the criteria that make you to fall under VFA because not necessarily all insurance contracts with direct participation features that will fall under VFA is those that are eligible. And they are eligible under these three conditions. One, the contractual term specified that the policy holder participate in the share of the clearly identified pool of underlining items. This is different from discretionary. This is direct. Two, the entity expect to pay the policy holder an amount equal to a substantial share of the fair value of return on the underlying item. And three, the entity expects a substantial portion of any changes in the amount to be paid to the policy order to vary with the changes in the fair value of the underlying item. It's only when these three conditions are in place that VFA, which is the variable field approach, can be adopted. Later on, we'll look at the uniqueness of it. But before then, Let's look at an example of a common VFA that are eligible. One, unit link insurance. People that are in insurance community like Dari, which we understand this. And what is this? Usually the most straightforward case of VFA eligibility applies to unit link insurance contract. Premium are invested in an investment fund on behalf of the policy holder and the payout of the policy See you that is directly linked to the performance of the underlying fund. Now, there's this regulation with Nikon. When you have a unit link insurance, you must separate the policy of the share, uh, the fund of the shareholder from the fund of the shareholders, uh, policy holders. The fund of the policy holder is invested and monitored strictly by Nikon so that the return goes directly to the policy holder's fund. And that will allow distribution to each policy holder appropriately. Yes, sir. Unique link insurance has that quality. Another one that has that quality is a minimum return guaranteed policy. And this one addresses contracts that offer minimum investment return guarantee to policy holders. For example, there are some policies going on in insurance company that will tell you that each year you have a guaranteed minimum return of 5%. Such is what we call minimum return guaranteed insurance contracts. That equally falls under, but again, not in all situations because it has one or two challenges. Okay, the other one 
is a payout link contract, a link to index. Now, this one is like, the payout is linked to, let me say, uh, uh, Dow Jones index, or let me pick Nigeria, uh, Nigerian uh, stock exchange index, the general index, or to any specific index within the capital market, or even bond index and some other things. When you have such, you call it a payout link index. Under some contract, payout to policyholders are linked to benchmark index, such as a yield on a basket of government bonds, stock index, or a specified subset of the net asset of the insurer. And the final one is the management discretion. This is much more of a discretionary participation features. And this may not be eligible to VFE because it has discretion, it's not guaranteed. And therefore it's ineligible in all ramification. And this speaks majorly to discretionary participation features in that manner. But to look at further, there are some thin lines between the GMM and the VFA. The methodologies are exactly the same, subject to very small differences in measurements and reporting. First, when we compare VFA with GMM, the only difference is that the group of insurance contracts our policy will that will participate in the share of clearly identified pool of underlining item. In GMM, is either they don't even participate in any underlining or they participate in underlining, but they have discretion. The issuer, which is the insurer, has discretion to determine what they get and what they do not get, unlike the direct. Now, what is the implication of this? The insurer expects that part of the profit of the underlying item need to be paid to the policyholder. Why the amount paid to the policyholder depends on the underlying item. The result is that VFA look like GMM, not different at the start of the contract, but as time goes on, there are differences. And there are differences in the measurement because GMM might warrant for changes in discount rates in order to reflect the return. And that is based on your accounting policy, we'll get to that level. Only the subsequent years, there are differences in the cash flows as part goes to policyholder. And the CSM does not reflect the on end profit of the insurer as part of it also belongs to the policy world order. Which means the portion of the CMM is now uh, more or less co-owned by both the company itself, which is the insurance company and the policy order unlike the GMM that is solely to the insurer. Now, what interest is accreted on CMM? Which is the unwinding of discounts we are going to see under CM, uh, CSM will not be applicable to CSM under VFA. It's only under GMM and we're going to see that. But it's adjusted for movement in insurance companies profit for investment activities because Part of that profit relating to investment activities belongs to the policy holders. Um, and we're going to see that. Okay, but when you look at it in pictorial form, you will find out that there's no visible difference between VFA and GMA. But in practical sense, there are differences. And the differences borders on the measurement of the contractual service margin, in which a portion of it belongs to the policy order. And that portion will be affected by variability in the returns in which that policy is indexed with or benchmark with. And secondly, there's a slight difference that might be attributed to the choice of accounting policy with respect to changes in the discount rates that may affect it. And we're going to see that as time moves on. Therefore, any question on VFA? Any question on VFA?
Okay, since there's no question of VFA, let's now look at the more simplified version of them all, the PAA. Okay. The PAA, which is the premium allocation approach, is intended to address simple version of it, especially with the fact that this policy is of a period of one year or below. And in that case, what are the uniqueness of it? One, simplified approach, which you may only use when contract are at inception on errors, or when the coverage period is smaller than one year, or when the insurer can show that the result of the PAA is not different than the GMM. But I've told you that situation might be rebooted because it's very rare. It could be, except if the longevity of the long-term insurance contract is also short in nature, two years contract, three years contract, as the case may be. The way of calculating insurance liability once a policyholder has indicated a claim is not different. The only difference is for the coverage period. What we are saying here is that remember that the insurance liability of two groups, insurance liability for remaining coverage and insurance liability for incurred claims. Measurement of insurance liability for incurred claims under PAA is exactly the same thing with VFA and with GMM. But where the difference lies is the insurance liability for the remaining coverage, which is the unexpired risk, is totally different because it follows much more of the end premium approach of the IFRS 4 or previous practices that are known for insurance businesses, which is common to life uh, uh, non-life policies or general insurance. Now, finally, with PAA, there's a simplified method comparable with our insurance currently do. While with GMM, are the cash flows discounting risk adjustment and CMM calculator, which means PAA is not necessarily unfamiliar with the terrain we are today because it's exactly in tandem with the terrain of unexpired risk measurements via an M premium approach or methodology that is currently in use. How can we represent this discussion pictorially? Pictorially, you can see that in Liability for incurred claims is exactly the same thing as what we have done before. The only difference is that discounting may not apply because of the short period of time it entails, unlike others, that this with long-term contracts. But the liability for remaining coverage is so simplified that it's in tandem with the on-end premium approach that we currently use in practice, okay? Which is the on-end premium uh, reserve, which you know. And let me try and do something. Let me try and share the slides. Let me try and go online for you to have view of um, on end premium reserve, how it is being measured. And how you are going to see it as we do here that is not different from what we are going to do under the PAA. Can somebody read this? Who will volunteer? OM Premium Reserve is an account where an insurance company places advanced insurance payments. These payments are going to be returned if policies are canceled before the period of coverage period begins. Okay, now let's now look at the reserving. Why is premium reserve on end? On end premium reserve, UPR or UEPR in some jurisdiction is an item appearing in the liability portion of the balance sheet. It reflects the amount of premium written, but not yet end. This reserve is for an unexpired risk, loss reserve. On the other hand, are for an expired risk. Okay, how do we calculate this 
the fact now, which is not also changing under I-517. How do you calculate on end premium reserve? Uh, you do a you do a portion read it, based on read it. Yes. okay. Sorry, sorry. How do you calculate? Sorry, collect the information needed to perform the calculations. Divide the premium by the total number of period in the term. Multiply the monthly amount by the periods remaining in the policy. Very simplified in nature. Okay. Thank you very much. Now, at a glance, let us see this picture. Where the biggest changes lie is in the long-term contract measurements. And there are six things we need to play with there. The first one is the premium. Whether it's a one-time premium or is a premium you get over time. One-time premium is common for annuity you purchase upfront. And over time, our policies like us, we undertake endowment policies, term assurance, and also things you do on a yearly basis or monthly payments. We also have estimation of our cash outflows. Our cash outflows is based on the claims you are expected to make over the policy period prior to its expiration. Also administrative and um, administrative and acquisition costs will also be integral part of your cash outflow. At the end of the day, the net position will be net of inflow, presumably. But if it's net of outflow, that means it is on errors from inception. Now, this net position, based on each cash flow on the timeline, will be discounted to the present using the appropriate discount rates. And the risk adjustment will be done to cater for the non-financial risk associated with the insurer undertaking the policy, which is like a compensation for the variability in the expectation of the cash flows that eventually crystallizes. And the result of one, two, three, four is what produces fulfillment cash flow. So female cash flow is a summation of the effect of one, two, three, four. Now this female cash flow, given that it is not NROs, will have produced a profit. But because we are told that we cannot recognize profit on day one, we will now have to effect an adjustment to zeroize that profit by way of recognizing and on end profits to negate that profit from being recognized on the one. And to do that, we are going to recognize a contractual service margin. Now for a profitable contract, a contractual service margin will be equal to five. What is five? Will be the same thing as the fulfillment cash flow, which is the summation of one, two, three, four. Otherwise, if it's a loss-making contract by way of portfolio of contracts, it will be considered onerous. And the contractual service margin will be zero. Why will it be zero? In order to force us to recognize the loss on day one. And that is why we came with this philosophy to say, your contractual service margin is either zero or negative of fulfillment cash flow, given that fulfillment cash flow is profit. We negate it to reduce it to zero in order to recognize a liability against it. And that is it. I want you to use 30 seconds to look at this sequence and this equation here before we delve into it further. So that if you have any question. Thank um. 
What can you guys deduce from this chart? What can you deduce from this chart? Hello, Mr. Amuiwa. Yes. Okay, so I wanted to know, at, uh, if you have done one and two and it results into negative, are you still going to go ahead and discount negative to have a negative fulfillment cash? Because at that point, you already have a loss. So why going ahead discounting? Okay. Now, discounting will play a role, whether it's positive or negative, because what you're estimating is not today. You're estimating into, let us say the policy is for five years. You're estimating absolute cash flow for five years, no premium and uh, settlement. You still need to discount both down to today before you even know what is your loss or profit in today's money terms. Therefore, discounting is compulsory because of the longevity involved to refer the effect of time value of money. Does that make sense? Okay, I have a question yes, in that sir. line too, sir. Okay. Okay, now I just want to know if this is, uh, if, if it happens in the insurance industry, when you have a, a contract, a policy contract with uh, a policy holder, uh, and later, maybe two years into the contract, you now realize that uh, the premium is going to be lower than the claim or the fulfillment cash flow will be much more than what you've accepted as a premium. And now it's now like an onerous contract. Is it possible to now make a new agreement with that policy order so that the person can pay more since it's going to result in... Uh, maybe well, since you do not value it properly at the inception of the contract, can you review that contract? It's not going to be possible because one, for individual contract you have, you are not expected to make profit. What I'm trying to say is this. We can look into a policy order and say, the reason why I'm doing business with you is that the premium you pay, anything you must claim should be lower than the premium you pay. Therefore, what am I insuring? I can do self insurance now. But the reason why insurance premium, uh, sorry, uh, uh, insurance contract might be onerous are for various reasons. Why? You didn't have the substantial pool. When you were doing this, when you develop the product and you're pricing it, you're expecting that you have one million in the pool. 
but eventually you have 200,000 in the pool. Which that means that the collection of the premium will not be sufficient for the severity of the claim that occurs. Or you even have that 1 million, but you didn't appropriately price the insurance well because the longevity of the contract, you never consider intense volatility and shocks that may skyrocket uh, more or less like and create more volatilities on other microeconomic variables, bringing about higher claims in higher terms. Probably you never consider higher depreciation over a longer period. Do you get what I'm saying now? Yes. I get what I'm saying now. Yes. And some other things like that. Therefore, the question then is anytime it is onerous. It becomes unavoidable contracts. Contracts that you can't terminate without incurring more costs than the benefit. Imagine you have taken life policy and they have already priced it and you are supposed to pay one million per year. And they now call you to say, ah, this policy is no longer favorable to us. So come on. You will not. And I'll tell you one reason. Today, they are doing it stylishly. Do you know the style they use? The style they use today is that once they see that it is onerous, it is onerous. Now, what, what they do is that they will not call you to tell you that they have a better product. Hmm. That that product is better than that one you have five years ago, that this one is more sweet. Do you know what they're trying to do? Instead of them telling you that it is onerous, it's no longer favorable, they will not want to induce you to move from that onerous one to profitable ones. You know, onerous or profitability is from their own perspective. So that stylishly, they close that bucket mm -hmm. and they limit their loss. Mm -hmm. I have one that they still continue to discuss with me and I've looked at it and know what I have now, I think is more favorable to me. But the way they are pressurizing that, no, this one is, you know, no. Do you understand that? Probably because I'm an actuary, I've looked at the basis and I felt like that old one is more favorable to me. But because it's not onerous to them, they are not trying to push people because you can't terminate it until it expires. Hmm. Otherwise, you understand? It's like termination of contract, breach of contract and all sorts of things. But there's a stylish way of doing it, which is the way they do it now. Okay. You can say now. Yes. But it's not something you can come and reprice. What you can reprice is a short term that has expired, like your vehicle, and you say, no, we are not taking 5% again. It's not 10%, because that one has expired. Mm -hmm. But anyone that has not expired, it's like I've taken policy of car now for one year. Then I came six months to say, ah, that rate is low. We can't take it again. You will not take it only after it has expired. Are you getting what I'm saying now? Yes. And that's the position. Yeah. I want, uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, Diet to speak on it. And I think Uche also, but Uche, I think I can't see Uche, but Diet, can you speak to that? Okay, sir. My own question surrounds the issue of this country. Before your question, can you speak to? What we have not discussed from your Okay, sir. You are very correct, sir. You are very correct. You are very correct. When a policy is seen in Fox, an insurer does not have the power to say that they are not going to do the policy again. So when they know that they call the policy is no longer profitable to them, like you have said exactly, they will look for a way to, to move away from the policy by convincing you to take another policy. Take another policy. Mr. Gary, that's what you people are doing. No, no, no. <laughs> it, that is how it is done everywhere. Not, not only in Nigeria, it is everywhere. But mm. even in, I think, in other clients, insurance is not well practiced in this part of the world. In other clients, for motor insurance, as an example, if you want to take a motor insurance policy, they don't just say, okay, our rate is 5%. Then they might have to look at your age, your driving history, your so many things. That is why you see that people 
that wants to take insurance policy, motor insurance policy in the, let me say in Europe, the same motor, the body, the same, the same, the, they don't pay the same premium, but in Nigeria, we pay the same premium. We say 5%, 5% for everybody. So Mr. Amiwa is right concerning, concerning that, that is what insurance companies do anyway. So we'll try to discourage you so that you can take up a more favorable policy to them. So thank you, sir. So uh, the, my question, sir, my question surrounding this country, rates. if we say that um, IFRS 7 has come for easy compatibility and the likes, sir, don't you think that the, the first, the discount rate here, do we mean the cost of capital available to each company, sir? No, we are going to see it. The discount rate should reflect the economic characteristics of the cash flows oh. that is unique to the portfolio. Oh. You understand? Is this not about a uh, working capital where we did have it? No. You understand? Okay, sir. Yes. And when we get there, we'll see this process further. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay, now let's now see at a glance. We want to make some comparison. This is the current gap. This is how we measure currently now. On a fire premium reserve, is usually when you less your default position cost, you get your liability for remaining coverage, which is your unexpired risk. Why undiscounted is that for past claims, including IBNR, is what you call your liability for insured claims, which is the expired risk. This is what we do now, current gap. We are now saying that we are moving away from current gap to IFRS methodologies. Now, if you move the first step, where you get to is the GMM. Your liability for remaining coverage will be made up of your contractual service margin, which is your end profit, your risk adjustment, which is to compensate for non-financial risk undertaken as an insurer, discounting of your best estimate of fulfillment cash flows because of time value of money. All of this, will, the result of this is going to give you the liability for remaining coverage, which is your own expired risk. Why for the expired risk is that the claim has been made, including IBNR and everything, what is your best estimate of what should be paid out since the claim has been established? If there's an effect of discounting because of a uh, passage of time, you also consider that, and any risk adjustment in terms of variability of the cash flow payouts. That will give you the liability for incurred claims. The sum of the two will give you your insurance contract liability. Now, there is no difference. So there's no major difference. Let me use that phrase between GMN and VFA. One, they are both building blocks and they are computed in the same manner. The exception here is for two things. One, discounting. Here, there's no changes in this country expected. But here, in VFA, there might be changes in discounts. And how do you account for the effect of changes in discounts, whether to profit or loss or OCI, is an accounting policy option, which you can take. But secondly, within the contractual service margin, not all of your profits will be accruable to you as an insurer. A portion of it, the cost is due to policy order based on the contractual terms of uh, adding to the insurance contract in direct participation features. This might also be split between the policy order and the business. And therefore, the product of this is what gives you the liability for remaining coverage, which is the unexpired risk. And similar to what we have done under the GMM, what we are doing here is exactly in tandem because they are all incurred uh, claims. And 
all of these are considered as building block approach. Okay. Now, the one that's not building block is the PAA. Now, there's no difference in the measurement of liability for in, sh in short claim between GMM, VFA, and PAA. The only difference is that discounting might not be applicable for PAA because of it is always less than 12 months. But when I say always, it's not correct if we use PAA for onerous contracts or we use PAA for long-term contract on the basis of approximation. Remember, we discussed that earlier. But discounting will be of no significance or consequence if PAA is adopted immediately for short-term contract of less than one year. Now, the unexpired aspect will be exactly the same way we have done it under the gap, which will be the premium we have received less acquisition cost will give us our on end premium reserve, which will form our liability for remaining coverage. And the sum of that liability for remaining coverage and liability for insurance claims will sum up to our insurance contract liability under IFRS 17. Does that make sense? Does that make sense to us? Yes, yes. Okay, now let us now move further to where we have critical issues. Critical issues is at the building block. What is the building block? The first block here is your cash inflows. Primarily from the pool of policy, it's expected that your cash inflows should be more than your cash what? Outflows, otherwise it will be onerous. Furthermore, the effect of discounting will much more affect claims than premium because premium usually precedes cash flow, uh, outflow of claims. Therefore, the effect of time value of money will eat cash flow in the future more than cash flow in the present. Remember your discounting principles. If I'm to discount 100,000 in year one, and discount 100,000 in year three, which one will have more impact in reduced cash flow? It is year three. Year three. You can say that. And cash flow that are claims are usually later. But cash flow of a premium are usually what? Earlier because it's a principle of no premium, no cover. Am I making sense? Do you get yes. the concept? Yeah. Okay. Now, therefore, the effect of it, you find out that it reduces the impact of this. Risk adjustment further increases the impact so that what is now left of all of these inflows in today's monitor is the CSM, which is the contractual service margin. You know, this uh, stuff is what we call watermark uh, in, uh, for people that do Excel and PowerPoint where you can see that, okay, what contribute to a value? How did your cash inflow reduce to CSM? Is the cost one, cash outflow reduces it, discount increases it, risk adjustment what reduces it, and you now have your CSM. Does that make sense? Okay, and that is that. Now, let us now see it in quantity, quantification terms. Now, this, is your existing income statement as an insurance company. Your gross premium, less premium seeded to insurance. The net of these two is what we call your net premium revenue. You now add your investment <laughs> Thereafter, you have your gross claim benefit and expenses, claim and expenses seeded to insurance. It will augment your claim. That is, once you have reinsured, once you have reinsured a contract, insurance contract, when claim arises, you are not going to bear the claim alone since you didn't enjoy the premium alone. Based on the proportion that have been seeded, 
once a claim is established, part of the claim you get reimbursed by the insurer. And that is that here. Acquisition costs, that is all those commissions you have paid, you don't expense them once before now. You'll be amortizing them over the average life of the policy. And that is what this is. And changes in your insurance liability measurements based on unexpired risk are coming here. And this is how you get your total expenses for insurance. And the difference between your total income for insurance and total expenses will give you your profits for insurance. Now, this is what exists now. And the argument is this. One, this gross premium is usually cash-based. Two, this gross claim is also including some level of deposits by way of repayment. Because you have missed up deposits with insurance and you have to mingle everything together. Even in this revenue, there are some element of deposit in it, which is inconsistent with how deposits should have been reported as a balance sheet item, including repayment of deposit as a balance sheet item. Acquisition cost amortization and changes in this also create some level of confusion within our financial statements that creates unnecessary volatility and without reflecting the economic substance of our insurance contract business. At the end of the day, you have created inconsistency in profit recognition, and you have also reduced drastically comparability because everybody has a different methodology, both internal model and those regulatory guidance or cover that have been used interchangeably to produce distorted results or performance. Now, we now have that all of this has become a limiting factor for users of financial report to have better understanding. This is from the aspect of the balance sheets, which now makes source of earnings difficult to identify because you've commingled everything into one another. Now let's look at the balance sheets. This is your typical existing balance sheets. Where you have multiple line items, inconsistency in terminologies, inconsistency in measurement, difficulties in understanding changes. Now, look at it. Your financial assets is them. You have different acquisition costs, which has no bearing because it relates to insurance contract, which will have been measured along with the insurance liability, which is not done in that manner. Premium receivables, insurance, insurance contract assets. Therefore, for only insurance contract, you have one, two, three, four, five lines created which can be more or less reduced to like two lines. And therefore, all of this are what IFRS 17 has come to change. 17 did not only change the recognition of insurance contract, it has changed the measurement of insurance contract, it has changed the reporting or presentation, and it has also changed the disclosures. Probably he has even changed virtually everything other than for short-term insurance contracts. And that's why this is a total overall of it. And I'll put it side by side. You see how distorted our existing standards and practices are to the IFI 17. And I'll also tell you further implications that might come up of that. But before I move on, I have a question here. For life insurance, is premium paid by the policyholder upfront as a lump sum at the inception of the contract or is paid periodically throughout the life of the contract? Now, yes and no. Life policy is also annuity. There are some annuity you purchase lump sum. For example, even your RSA account, which will be moved to retiree account under Nigerian Pension Act of 2014, 
give room for you to purchase as much as I think 25% or 50% as annuity of your mom D. And what it means is that if you purchase an annuity, let me say you retire at the age 60, and you purchase an annuity for 10 years, what happens is that, let me say they pay out 50% pension, the other 50% is used to purchase annuity. If the 50% you use to purchase annuity is 10 million, they might tell you that, okay, you'll be getting 1.2 million per year for the next 10 years, provided you are alive. What it then means is that you are paid 10 million upfront as premium, and you'll be enjoying your annuity receipts on a yearly basis for 10 years, or if you a life annuity, you enjoy it for life, the earlier of when you die or you enjoy it for life. You can see now, that is a policy where you might pay premium upfront at once. But most life policies, premium are paid periodically like endowment policies, term assurance, old life, and all sorts of things. Does that make sense, sir? Okay. There's another question. From experience and some contract I've seen, payment is usually every year. I've also been approached to make three year down payment in advance. If I have money, so you could pay lump sum if you have excess, but it is usually yearly payment, yes. Now, what Apple also says that insurance company now, because they need fund in advance much more, they now promote you to pay much more in advance, like the what you said, three years in advance and all sorts of things. They now sell a discount to you to say, instead of paying premium of one million per year, if you are to pay three years in advance, it will be 2.7 million. Therefore, they will lose 300,000 to entice you. Because if you are paying yearly, it will be 3 million over three years. But if you pay it once now, it will be 2.7 million. Therefore, that is also a problem. Okay. Now let's look at what the profit income statement will look like now and the balance sheet. Under IFR 17, insurance revenue will be drastically reduced to what actually is your revenue. Because Deposit component or investment component will totally be removed because it's a balance sheet item, similar to the way bank recognizes deposit liability. Likewise, insurance service expenses will also drastically be reduced because deposit components in the repayment will also be removed. And likewise, the cash basis aspect of revenue associated with costs will also no longer be enforced. And the insurance service expense will be made up of the following. Insurance claim and insurance contract expenses. Insurance contract acquisition costs and gains or losses from reinsurance. Which means you will no longer be recognizing reduction of revenue to reinsurance seeded and reduction of uh, insurance service expense or claim with reinsurance seeded, no you will not have a single line that account for gain or loss from your insurance. What that means is that users of financial statement, likewise with management, will be better informed about their price of your insurance, whether it's even effective or not. Why will I be making losses on insurance? Therefore, it then means it doesn't worth it, especially if I'm the one holding on to an insurance and the one seeding. You understand? Because what is the essence of me seeding if eventually I'm still going to make laws on reinsuring the liability of uh, insurance liability I've assumed. Now, the net effect of your insurance revenue and your insurance service expense is what produces your insurance service results. We'll call it result because that is not necessarily profit associated with the whole activities of your insurance or your insurance. There's other aspect of it that is associated with investment income and other aspect of it that is associated with insurance finance expense, which is the aspect of the unwinding of discount and some other things inherent in the insurance liability. 
we are going to see that, especially with respect to unwinding discount on both the fulfillment cash flow and the CSM. We are going to see it as time goes on. And the net financial result is produced. Okay. Thereafter, the net financial result, which is this is financial related, plus the insurance service results will produce what we call the profits before tax. When you see this, this is more richer in content, in amount, and will provide more relevant and more comparable information. And this is one thing we need to take note of. Let us see similarly from the balance sheet perspective. In the balance sheet, you find out that we streamline it by only showing insurance contract liabilities and also showing insurance contract what asset because they can't be netted off. Why can't they be netted off? Is because if you as an insurer see part of your insurance risk to another insurance company, if liability crystallizes and the other insurance company is unable to meet up with you, that doesn't stop your own primary obligation to fully indemnify the policy order. That is why you have to separate it. It means instead of having about five or six under the old gap, we now have only one, two, which is insurance contract liability, which in the disclosure, you can further break it down into insurance contract liability for incurred claim, and that for all, uh, remaining coverage, which is unexpired risk. And that is that. Now, let me now put it side by side. Okay, before side by side, let me show you something. Now, how do you measure insurance contract liability? Remember, the PV of the future cash flows, which is usually the current, because we have discounted it to the present, plus the risk adjustment, which is usually the current, plus the on end profit, which is the CSM, which is usually non current, because CSM is the on end profit over the covered period, which is on end. The sum of these three is what considers insurance liability, which means in your disclosure or notice financial statement, this insurance liability will be further broken into current and not current in this manner. Okay, and it can also be further broken into liability for incurred claims and liabilities for remaining coverage. Now let's now look at it side by side. What we have discussed, see the reporting. Under old gap and under IFI 17. Can you see, who can tell you that is the same transaction that produces financial performance? Every ratio you can put under FI 70 is totally different from that. Yes. There's no resemblance. It doesn't even show as if we are the same situation, the same company, the same transaction, and the same period. Does this shock any one of you? Mr. Uche, the regulator. I, I, I've, been, I've been laughing at the account. I'm just, wow. <laughs> this, 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 this is quite interesting. This is quite interesting. And it's quite self-explanatory. You know, like on like the, like the Kuba sum method we have before. <laughs> That's it. Now let's look at the balance sheet. The profit or loss is more distorted than the balance sheet. The balance sheet still has some level of resemblance. The profit or loss is totally off. And over the life of the policy, assuming the entire life of the policy is two years, your equity position will not necessarily be impacted because the profit under the old regime and the new regime will be the same if the policy is to run from beginning to the end and you sum up everything. But because of the timing difference, the profitability and the equity will pay you over a long period of time. Because as you have policy of 10 years, you have five years, you have two years, you have three years and overlapping. 
And that one is coming. Therefore, you won't find yourself in this situation where the equity will be the same. Never and never will it happen because there's overlap. Now, see how we further broke it down. And somebody volunteer to use the knowledge you have discussed so far to elaborate on what I just show you now. Who will volunteer? Who will volunteer? So, are you there? Okay, I'm here. Okay. okay. I, I mean, um, from what you have shown us, uh, there is a serious uh, difference from where we are coming from and where we are now. So this one is just revealing the insurance revenue, which includes basically the premium that will eliminate any deposit, that includes any deposit and all, all deposits will be reported under the liability. And this will be strictly basically the insurance revenue and the insurance service expenses will just basically be the claims that we have um, we have incurred. So we are either we have incurred and not reported yet, uh, and that we make estimates for and all that to be reported under those expenses, uh, the insurance service expenses. Then other investment income that the company has and their insurance uh, finance expenses, which will include some, um, but I'm very convinced about unwinding of discounts in reporting under this insurance finances, because I see also the effect of discount rate changes in insurance liability. I thought that is uh, where the uh, unwinding of discounts are a result of, uh, you know, revaluation or evaluation of those insurance liability will come to. So I need you to clear that because this is expense. I was expecting it to be basically maybe they have loans, the interest on loan and all that. For the unwinding to come here, I think you should buttress that more. But I thought that was the same thing with the effect of discount rate changes on the insurance liability. Okay, thank you. Let me start from where you start. Thank you. Let me start. The insurance finance expert, expense, which is the uh, is on this uh, is a discounting unwinding of discount inherent in the present value. Remember that we measure the fulfillment cash flow at the present value. Okay, the cash inflow, which is a premium, and the cash outflow, which are the expected claims, are measured at present value based on discount effect. And this discount ought to be on one on the fulfillment cash flow, and likewise be on one on the CSM except for VFA. Therefore, in that instance, the unwinding is synonymous to any form of unwinding of discount associated with any form of transaction other than insurance contract. And they are now reported in similar manner, it will be reported for every other contract, including business combination, different consideration, and all sorts of things. Anywhere discount unwinding is considered, the effect will be recognized within finance costs, which in insurance uh, reporting now, we we'll call that finance costs insurance finance expenses, which is totally different from the uh, interest on loans. You understand? Interest on loan will fall under other interests. It will not necessarily fall under financial results because financial results here and investment income here are integral to the uh, insurance business. Because again, the premium that is collected by the insurance company are not just kept idle. They are equally invested to enhance returns. And that's why this insurance finance expense is equally matching the investment income. And that's why when you come here, you see what we did here, whereby the investment income is this, finance income is this, which is when you look at it in this period, yearly do you have enough assets of your investment income over your financing income for your insurance business. Okay, and 
Also, a portion of this insurance finance expense may go into OCI. This OCI is only optional and it only affects you when you use VFA. Because it's only under VFA, you might more or less have a change in uh, discount rate as opposed to what you have locked in as a rate. For GMM, you must lock in your rate without any subsequent changes. Now, when you now choose an accounting policy where the difference between your new rates and uh, discount rates and what was locked in at the inception can be recognized in other compensative income. Otherwise, both can also be recognized here. It's a function of your accounting policy, which you must follow consistently. Now, one thing I wanted to point your attention to here is this. Now, the attention there is that your insurance contract revenue consists of the following. Expected claims and benefits, expected expenses, amortization of CSM, release of risk adjustment, amortization of attrition costs and premium due on or written prohibited. All of these are impliedly embedded in this insurance revenue. Likewise, insurance expenses, if you check what we did here by breaking it down, it's more or less in trigger of in short claims, which is the actual claims you made in that year, and any increase or decrease associated with insurance contracts as it expires or as you continue to render the service, and also insurance contract acquisition costs that have been incurred in the current period and gain or losses from insurance contracts. And that is that. Now, thank you, sir. This, these factors, we we'll now need to look at them one by one. You know, there are five factors we consider. Yes. Okay. Though there are six, if you go back here, there are six. But what I did is that I now combined the two. Remember, here there are six. But cash flow, cash inflow, cash outflow, we now have to marry them together to net them off so that we are now able to connect cash inflows. Okay, that's now in this six to five. Now, what are the five? The best estimate of a cash flow, which is the inflow after netting off the outflow, discounting, the risk adjustment, the fulfillment cash flow, and the contractual risk margin. Now, let's put them one by one. How do you make best estimate of your cash flows, of your fulfillment cash flows? The first one you'd consider is in estimating this, you must be consistent with observable market prices in case claim arises. Claim of motor vehicle, claim of other debts, and all sorts of things. You must also consider current values which means you are looking at measurement dates because the methodology of insurance control liability is current measurement model. Also, you must consider various possible outcomes or scenarios which are probability weighted, which means is an expectation of values. Also, the entity perspective for other cash flow estimates must also be considered and it varies from entity to entity. Incorporate all available information in an unbiased manner. That's why we consider the best estimate an unbiased best estimate of cash flows. Also, you must include both intrinsic value and time value of options for and guarantees that are embedded in the insurance contract. Now, again, when we say probability weighted expected cash flows, what we are saying here is very simple. Expected cash flows, and the probability weighted is talking about the expected value, which I've mentioned earlier. There must be explicit cash flows, unbiased, and probability weighted. And they must relate to the future cash flows that will arise as the insurer fulfills his obligation within the insurance contract. Okay, now let's look at the discount rates. Somebody asked a question about the discount rate. Now, what discount rate are we going to use? Is it weighted average cost of capital? Is it minor cost of capital? Is it incremental borrowing rate? 
What are we going to use? But I'll summarize it at the beginning that the discount rate we use is the rate that reflects the economic characteristics of the cash flows associated with the insurance contracts. Now, what are these? The following should be taken into consideration. One, the discount rate you are going to use should reflect the time value of money, the characteristics of the cash flow, and the liquidity characteristics of the insurance contract. The rate you are going to use should be consistent with observable current market prices for financial instruments with cash flows whose characteristics are consistent with those of the insurance contract in terms of, for example, timing, currency, and liquidity. The rate you are going to use must exclude the effect of factors that influence such observable market prices, but do not affect the future cash flows of the insurance contract. The essence here is that the rates should, we should avoid duplication. If the rate we have an association with factors that already influence market prices, whereas the rate we are considering has also considered that impact of market prices, it will be double counted. Therefore, that exclusion is critical. And finally, the discount rate is fixed at the inception of the insurance contract. That's why we call it a locked-in rate. Locked-in rate is that you don't change the rate. From inception, it's already locked over the life of that policy. The only time you can have a change in that rate is when your accounting policy supports that, and it's only applicable under a VFA. VFA is variable fee approach, and it's only applicable under VFA if you have an insurance contract with direct participation features that is eligible. Remember, we have considered the eligibility of an insurance contract with direct participation features. We must take note of that. Now, before I uh, permit Shagun to speak, because I could see you raise up your hand. Lastly, option. There are options with respect to the discount rates, and the option is only available for VFA, as I mentioned earlier. We switch to one method not specified can be used, provided it relates to the VFA, an OCI option instead of income statements, and discounting is not required if capital are expected to be received or paid within one year from the date the claim are to be incurred. But again, you see an option. If you see a limit fee that is material, you can. Otherwise, discounting will not apply for less than one year. And that is that. Over to you, Shelly. OK, so uh, thank you very much. My question is that, um, just a moment. I have two questions that I want to ask. Number one is that uh, people that go out to investigate the occurrence of an insured event to know the magnitude and different things. Uh, where do we include the uh, the cost incurred? Is it part of insurance expenses or something? It's part of insurance service expense. If you remember, let me take you back here. Um, When we talk about insurance service, okay, I think I've bypassed it. Where we broke it down into insurance service expense includes insurance claims, uh, administrative expenses, and every expenses in you fulfilling your obligation to the insured or to the policy order in line with the contractual term of that um, of that insurance contract. Okay, sir. So my second, my second question is that under IFRS 17, when we are trying to value the liability to be, uh, to be incurred or the reserve that we're gonna make regarding a particular insurance contract, are we going to look at it from the perspective of the amount to take to replace the particular insured event? Or maybe let's, let's take for instance, uh, uh, property insurance. 
Are we going to take it from the perspective of how much will it cost to replace that particular property to indemnify the uh, insured person or the amount it will take to repair? You know, I think this is, these are two different things. For instance, maybe I'm insuring my car and when, I'm, when the insurance company is trying to book the liability, we then book it from the perspective of the cost it will take to buy the insured person a new car or the cost to take to like repair it to the present, uh, I mean, to a useful or usable uh, state. Now, what happened is this, uh, the severity of the insured event matters in estimating your cash flows. An accident to a car is a binary option. Is either it brings about accident that call for repairs or accident that calls for replacement. Cost for repairs means the repairs cannot be more than the sum assured or sum insured. Otherwise, it will be termed economic loss. And if it's not repair, it's replacement, it means you can't be replaced more than the sum insured, which is the economic loss. And therefore, it is those experience that will form the basis of what cash flow will allow me to discharge my obligation to the insured or to the policy holder. Does that make sense? Yes. The question is very simple. How do I more or less get discharged? And that is what matters. Whatever it will cost you to get discharged of an obligation to a policy order is what you base your cash flow estimation on, regardless of the situation. Okay. You can say now. Okay, sir. but in technical terms, the, the guys that go to investigate, uh, you know, a situation or maybe uh, a, a situation that calls for a uh, claim, what are they called in technical terms? I don't know. Loss adjusters. Loss adjusters. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, because you know, average insurance company want to reduce the loss and also believe that once people are aware that insurance covers something, they tend to inflate prices. Even it might not be policy or that might be a mechanic. Once you tell your mechanic my insurance will pay. <laughs> it felt like insurance is like a national cake. Even in the US, medical insurance, once they know that you have medical insurance, they just will be you anyhow. But once it's cash, you will sit down with them and negotiate. <laughs> okay. Okay, so one last question. I'm, I'm sorry to, to bring this in. So okay. in a situation whereby you have a health insurance policy, and the insurance company is also uh, the is, is also the company that provides that health service to the assured. How do we treat this? No, what do you mean? Can like you for instance, if the insurance company also has a subsidiary within the group that is like an hospital or a medical laboratory yes. that also provide health service, like it's is the one providing the insurance and also performing the service at the same time? No, it's not, it's not the one providing the uh, insurance and performing service. It's only providing insurance. It's not performing the service. A subsidiary is not the same thing as that entity. Legal aspect to it has distinguished them. They are not the same. Okay. It's only using influence to direct business to its subsidiary, but they are not the same. You can't consider that as self insurance, you understand? And that will speak to something that is critical in Nigeria. It's so funny that in Nigeria, health insurance, when I say health insurance, the one that is backed by law, compulsory health insurance, is not under insurance uh, uh, regulation in Nigeria. It's totally off it. And I've never, till now, I've never understood that. And I remember in 2011, upon adoption of RFRS, uh, then I was still in Deloitte and we were more or less giving support to Nikon. Then uh, um, uh, Mr. Fala Daniel was the commissioner for insurance. 
And I still put it on the table that how come NHF, NHIS, or what do you call it? NHIS, not under NICOM regulation. It's so funny. It's an insurance product, but it's managed by people that have no technicalities of insurance. It's under an agency that have no level of insurance. And that's why you find out that today in Nigeria, NHIS is not performing in terms of how it's supposed to perform. Because every principle surrounding it, including capitation and all sorts, of things, are purely insurance products. I don't know what the government might likely do, because even the accounting of IFI 17 now applies to every HMOs. But because in Nigeria, they don't see them as insurance. That's where the problem is. Mr. Uche, can you give us guidance on that from Nikon's perspective? Um, OK, yes. Um, the NHIS Act moved the insurance, um, health insurance to NHIS. And what they do most times, they have insurance desk officers on, on their team that help to give them guidance on the health insurance. But like you pointed out, most times they don't recruit um, very good guys to give them guidance. And the regulatory body, which is NHIS, that is supposed to monitor them, how uh, was their technical capacity to um, check on that insurance aspect? So like you pointed out, that is a lacuna on the government. And that is why we are having issues in even medical insurance, in the health insurance, which is not operated, um, like you said. But I think there are discussions on the table to see how they can strengthen their regulation for the HMOs. And I, I, I believe NICOM can partner with them because you are sister agencies, you are under the same father and mother. And I think NICOM can support them because it's to the benefit of us all. I don't see them even talking about IFI 70 at all because from their own angle, we are not insurance company. Yes, that is the way they look at it anyways. But like you said, the, the scope of the insurance, the IFRS 17 is going to force them to, um, well, like you said, if the regulator, which is NHIS. You're not I know, but I know, but with time, with time. But you said, like you said rightly, we are doing a lot with PENCOM. I think NICOM should also start partnering with, um, with NHIS because th th that is what affects the masses um, most. So it's a, it's a good suggestion. Um, I will take in from there to the authorities. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, um, somebody wanted to ask a question, Mr. Dari. Sir, sir, uh, oh. sir. In the current practice, we used to have technical expenses separated for, from management expenses. But in this new IFRS 17, in the SCI you showed us, uh, both, I would now be, I did now, both technical and management expenses, I did now, we did now be reported in the insurance service expenses now, as a direct all, cost. Yeah, let us first, of, there's no even direct cost in this, uh, in this case, but first, what we are only interested in is our city cost to each underwriting insurance contract. Now, what we also want you to do is to provide clarity for us all, what distinguishes your technical expenses from management expenses? What are the attributes of those expenses so that we can provide the guidance in it? Okay, for technical expenses, like the claims expenses, acquisition costs, commission paid to insurance brokers, claims expenses and the like. But for management expenses, there are normal expenses that is not peculiar to insurance industry alone, like the normal expenses that we have salaries, finance costs, and the likes. Normal expenses that is not peculiar to insurance industry. Okay. So that thank is what we- Yeah, have. thank you very much. Why you also look at this income statement made comprising between the existing gap and the new gap, we found out that we didn't even consider what you call management, which we we'll consider as administrative or general administrative expenses in both existing and this. 
No, we are not talking, we didn't look at other expenses like admin salaries, no. We are only looking at the top line activities that border solely on insurance business. Are you getting it now? Which means technical expenses is an integral part of insurance service expenses, which is included in this yes. insurance contract expenses. Do you can say now, whereas management expenses, administrative or general administrative as the case may be, have nothing to do with insurance as a business. That goes within your other operating expenses where you have salary and also of things, rent and etc. Okay. That's why you find out that what we are okay, putting okay, here are results attributed to insurance business and related business to that insurance. That's why they didn't use the term profit, they use the term results. Does that make sense, sir? Okay. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Any other question? Okay. Now let's look at risk adjustments. The risk adjustment is to reflect compensation that the insurer requires for bearing or certainty for non-financial risk. Remember that the risk primarily undertaken by the insurer was insurance risk. But in the risk of undertaking insurance risk, we have also assumed some non-financial risk that are not insurance risk, such as variability in cash flow. Remember, because of market prices have gone up, the repairs we're supposed to have done for 1 million as emphasized by you is now 1.5 million. Therefore, you also have to be compensated for it. The effect of that compensation is what we are uh, considered as risk adjustment. And this adjustment measures compensation to make entities indifferent between range of possible outcomes fiscal flow to the same expected values. Now, the key characteristics of all of this is so that the risk adjustment should more or less be explicit and should be considered from a company's perspective, which means it should not be considered from an exit or fair value perspective, but from actual, which is like an entry value perspective. It's also considered risk arising from contract only. Only the risk associated to that contract. non eligible risk only, which means it's not risk we are adding and also of uh, thing. And also fulfillment value is what is considered in that perspective, okay? And also you consider diversification of your portfolio. But again, all of these things is based on estimation. And that's why the standard requires as part of your disclosure is that to what confidence level have you been able to estimate your risk adjustment? I remember from business statistics, confidence level usually could be 95. The most common confidence level is 25% level. It could be 90 and it could be extreme 99, which is very rare. And that is that. Okay, now fulfillment cash flows is simply the summation of that one, two, three. And what is it? The fulfillment cash flow to reflect the profit expectation over the lifetime of the contract. So that profit should reflect the current measurement and such profit will not be recognized. The inability to recognize it is what created our contractual service margin, which we are going to see in the next module. The timeline of human cash flow should reflect one historical data, which is based on your past experience, your future expectation, which is based on your forecast, and adoption of assumptions to changes in trend and life expectancy, especially for life policies, and updates at each reporting date to reflect your current measurement. All of this should be in tandem with your basis of estimating the best fulfillment cash flow, best estimate of your fulfillment cash flow. Now, what is fundamental of them all is the contractual service margin. 
no risk margin. Contractual service what? Margin. Okay. Now, remember we said something here. This contractual service margin, first of all, represent on end profit over the coverage period, which is the profits that should have been seen on day one that has been kept in abeyance or suspended as a liability, which will be recognized by way of amortization over the average COVID period. And what then do we do is that we amortize the contractual service margin upon the accretion by way of uh, unwinding of discount. We're going to see that in our model. And what you do is that there are various basis of doing that. We can do that on a simplified basis. So for our basis is that if your average in the court, court means the group that have similar attributes that make up that portfolio. Now within the court, you might more or less divide it on an average of the coverage period. What it means is that if the average life of a court is three years, the coverage life is three years, and you have 1.2 million naira contractor service margin. In the first year, you are going to recognize one third of that 1.2, which is 400. In the second year, the revised service margin as a result of a one year of discount, you also divide it by two years remaining, you recognize the portion and the balance of it is recognized in the third year. That is a simplified approach. But another approach you can use is that you can use the coverage units, okay? And the coverage unit is, the first approach assumes that equality, unbiased equality in the coverage units. But the second approach is that the coverage unit might vary in nature, so that probably within a court, you have a single portion crystallizing in year one, than in year two or year three and all sorts of things. Therefore, you now use the units, which is a unit of measurement of whether in terms of uh, value of uh, what's it called, liability that may ensue from that uh, portfolio to use as a basis for amortization. And I'm going to show you that briefly as we move on. Okay, and sometimes you can also use an annuity basis to do that. We're also going to show you in one way or the other in our discussion, okay? But take note, CSM can be negative for CDL insurance held. I will discuss that later, okay? Now, CSM cannot be negative, but it can be negative for insurance CDL because that's why we produce gain or loss on insurance. But for normal uh, policy that is underwritten directly, CSM can never be negative. The maximum it is, is to, it will be zero. Remember what I showed you here? This equation I postulated earlier. Equation. Because the fulfillment cash flow will produce negative if it's profit, it can never be negative because of the minus one implication. If it is loss, for it to be negative, we force it to be zero in order to force us to recognize the loss. But we are going to see that in the model we are going to build now. Also, CSM is reduced to zero. Expected losses arising will be immediately recognized in profit or loss. Previously recognized losses can be reversed arising from favorable changes in estimates. Adjusted for changes in risk and estimate of the fulfillment cash flows related to the future services. Locking rate should be used for accretion of interest and calculation of changes in cash flow that offset the CSMs. Remember, CSM is a contractual service margin. Okay, now let us now look at this. The simplified premium, uh, the, uh, simplified approach, which is a premium allocation approach. For us to do that, I'll play this video for us. Launching into to PAA and just assuming it's a relative. 
there are a quite a lot of complications that we need to be thinking about before fully launching into to PAA and just assuming it's a relatively simple change from, from what we're doing now. So I think the first thing is around measurement. So, you know, not every insurer will be eligible for PAA. So there are strict rules about eligibility. The, the simplest one is, you know, if you've got contracts less than one year, then you automatically apply. For longer contracts, you need to fundamentally demonstrate that by applying PAA, what the answer that you're going to get is not materially different from, from the general model. And there's a sort of restriction on that as well, that if you expect your cash flows to be significantly variable, then again, you won't be able to use the PAA. So we have to think about how we're going to qualify for, for PAA. And if, if you do, um, and your contracts are longer than one year, making sure your audit is involved at an early stage, that, that, that your justification is, is valid. IFRS 17 is all based around the unit of account, and so that means grouping contracts together for measurement purposes, and PAA is no different. So we do have to think about how we're going to group our, our contracts together when we're doing the, the PAA approach. And then there's acquired contracts. So often insurers are buying books of business or transferring books of business around the group, and unfortunately, under the, the PAA, it's, it's often the case that you can run into difficulty if the contracts have um, moved into, into runoff effectively, where the general model principles then apply. So it's going to be important to consider uh, making sure you have the right kind of solution that can handle acquired books of business, because inevitably that may well happen in the future. And I think the biggest area that is, is probably a complexity for, for insurers looking to do PAA is onerous contracts, because if a contract um, is, is deemed to be onerous, and the standard uses the words facts and circumstances, so you don't necessarily have to measure fully the contracts under the general model every reporting, but if indeed it is clear that the contracts are, are onerous, then, then you need to unfortunately apply the full GMM functionality. So although you're getting a simplification, uh, you need to be very aware that you may require the GMM functionality in your solution. So around data, so with the groupings, with the different kind of categories, then it's, it's often going to be the case that data isn't at the right level of granularity. So that could mean uh, disaggregation of data, and you're going to need some processes to manage that. So an allocation engine as part of the solution is going to be very important. And those allocations could be quite complex. They may require to be based on balances, or indeed they may be based on non-financial aspects. So you need quite a sophisticated allocation engine to handle that. The fundamental measurement of the liability for remaining coverage in um, PAA is based on what's premium received. So, you know, I think in the early days, people just thought, okay, premium, but then, you know, it's become clear that this really is premium received, i.e. the cash premium received by the company. And I think a lot of businesses may not have that kind of data easily accessible. So that's something to look into early in the project is really how can you measure premium received and in a timely manner book that for your accounting. And then in terms of the LRC, we have the um, LRC release mechanism. So, you know, currently a lot of insurers are using a premium earned basis that under PAA you're allowed to release it based on a simple straight line time basis. But there are other mechanisms, uh, if, if appropriate, where you might need to release it based on a on a, a risk profile. So it's important to look at the kind of calculations that you might need for your LRC release and have you really got the correct data and can it be assigned assigned to the uh, relevant um, PAA contracts. I think another thing to think about is when they've got open open cohorts and you're building up um, premiums for policies over time, you need to be able to track those premiums um, as, uh, as they've been booked and therefore the releases may need to be attached to those. So there could be some complications in that mechanic. And another area is pre-acquisition costs. So this could mean simply that you just paid the broker before the policy incepted and you need to keep track of that asset before amortizing it against the um, revenue line. But there's recently in the, you see in the exposure draft is you're actually allowed now to allocate some of the acquisition costs to renewals. And that 
means a you're going to have to run that kind of allocation calculation but then secondly you're going to have this acquisition cost asset on the balance sheet waiting to see if the policy reviews or not so that means you'll need to test it for impairment and indeed have a, a whole aspect of your solution that can measure and keep track of that so then one of the biggest areas um, that unfortunately isn't necessarily simplified in PAA is the incurred claims. So um, incurred claims are effectively measured under the general model principles. Um, insurers may not have as part of their current actuarial process the ability to produce cash patterns because you need to measure your incurred claims based on a future projected cash flow so the outputs of your actuarial model need to produce cash uh, cash flow uh, type outputs um, if your claims are expected to settle within one year then you don't need to uh, do any discounting but if you do have longer liability claims then discounting under the general model principles apply in which case you'll need to think about the correct rate and of course make sure the um, finance expenses are correctly accounted for in the books. I think another area particularly around claims is the modeling of claims so you know the the date that you need to look at for uh, incurred claims projection is the reporting date so that may not be you know how your modeling currently works where you might be looking at accident year or or another basis and also the the way that you're actually projecting your claims may not group neatly into the IFRS 17 group. So there can be a number of areas around modeling of your incurred claims that need changing to map into the processes required for IFRS 17. And similarly, uh, the incurred claims have to have a risk adjustment attached to them. So you may be currently producing some sort of risk margin or solvency two basis, but whether that applies uh, to, in IFRS 17 needs to be reviewed and that you'll need a process then to produce a risk adjustment at the level of granularity for the IFRS 17 group. So it's not necessarily the case that your current claims modeling and forecasting process will be suitable for IFRS 17 and it needs to be looked at early in the project. And then finally, I think is, is reinsurance. So a lot of reinsurers are looking to see whether they can apply the PAA and indeed general insurers may well have reinsurance on the book. So reinsurance is an aspect that needs to be factored in to the project. So firstly, it's not obvious that your reinsurance contracts uh, will be measured, can be measured under the PAA, so that needs to be tested. Just because the underlying contracts are measured under PAA it doesn't necessarily follow that your reinsurance can. Reinsurance contracts can be quite complex and there can be issues in terms of assessing what is the initial recognition point and what is the overall uh, contract uh, boundary and indeed there can be mismatches with the underlying contracts which may create further complications if you've been accounting for your reinsurance based on underlying contract data so that would need uh, to be uh, looked at. <clears throat> and then the reinsurance uh, aspects of RFS 17 require you to look at cash flows for relating to credit risk for counterparties so this may well not be something you're doing now so you'll need access to uh, credit risk models and then probably one of the most uh, complex areas now in RFS 17 and you know, it was, there was a lot of calls from the industry to address mismatches between profitability on underlying contracts and reinsurance. Um, and that has been addressed to some extent in the standard now. But you do need to maintain these links between the underlying contracts and the reinsurance contract. Firstly, because where you have proportionate reinsurance, you're allowed to take into account the loss on the underlying business and potentially recognize gains on your proportionate reinsurance. Uh, which which a lot of insurers would find useful uh, and and therefore you need that that mapping and that ability to look at balances and that's some some that's an area where sub ledger solutions are particularly strong um, in fact Okay, now we are back to that. Let's now briefly discuss on the PAA. As I'll add that PAA is very simplified 
and uh, it applies equally to the insurance and the insurance um, contracts, both inward and outward. What is inward is the insurance contract you underwrite or issue, and outward is the insurance contract you seed to, to another insurance company. Okay, uh, the first thing we need to understand is this that when a contract eligible for PAA, okay, at the inception, if the coverage is less than one year, it qualifies for PAA, or at the inception, if there's a reasonable expectation that there won't be measurement difference between using PAA and using GMM, or which is a BBA, you can use it all for an onerous contract, as the case may be. Now, take note also that using PAA may not be met if expected income viability in the fulfillment calculus before a claim is incurred. And in that slide, viability increases with length of contract coverage, which I told you that I practically will not expect any long term contract with longer longevity to have PAA approximate GMM except for those of two, three years, which is the length covering that's no more than two, three years. And also variability increase with embedded derivatives because of the volatility associated with derivatives. Okay, but let's look in depth to PAA. Now, PAA will mostly be adopted by non-life businesses, especially in Nigeria, when most of our non-line businesses are unable to underwrite businesses that is far more than one year, max two years. Therefore, they are favorably disposed to adopting PAA, which we call general insurance businesses. Multi-year policies such as construction, retrospective reassurance, risk assetting reassurance, ETC, may not be eligible because of the longevity involved. Okay, now what is the key features which may restrict PAA eligibility? One, the difference between the incident of risk, earning pattern used under PAA versus CSM earning pattern based on coverage units. Exposure to discount rate driven by the level of discount rates and the length of the claim payout pattern over time. And finally, the impact of positive and negative shocks, which would change the on end profitability assumptions. This might be a limiting factor to the adoption of PAA, especially for long-term insurance contracts. Okay, that is that. Um, now, let us now look at a form of decision tree that determines eligibility, what will always guide us. And in using this decision tree, what you must always bear in mind at every point in time is that don't prevent your desire. Ask those questions and answer those questions as the case may be. Now let's look at them one by one. Can somebody take us to this decision tree? Who will volunteer to take us to the decision tree? Okay, I can volunteer. Okay. So it's saying that is the coverage period one year or less? So if the coverage period is one year or less than one year, if the answer is yes, so we use the PAA. PAA is automatically applicable. But if it is no, that is if it is more than one year, then at exception, would the PAA differ materially from the BBA? So I don't know. I don't know what you mean by BBA this time around. PAA is a building block approach. Okay, so building block like approach. PMM. Okay, it's all right. So if it is more than one year, would the PAA differ materially from the BBA? So if the answer is no, it may be possible to construct an argument that PAA is applicable. That is, if the uh, period of the coverage is more than two years, then we need to ask another question that will the result differ materially from what we have under the general approach? If the result will not be different, then we can still possibly use the PAA approach. So uh, is significant 
variability in the fulfillment cash flow expected, which may affect the measurement of the liability for remaining coverage during the period before the claim. So that's asking if there will be a significant variability in the fulfillment cash flow. So that is a question that must be answered. More challenging to construct an argument that PAA is applicable. That is, if there will be significant variability in the cash flow, it's very difficult for us to, to know whether PAA approach will be applicable. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much in that light. Okay. Um, let us now look at it. We've looked at this before now, but again, we can look at it again now. The simplified premium allocation approach option for many short-term non-power contracts. The, the key differences compared with above is that liability for remaining coverage not analyzed into cash flow risk and on-end profit. Short-term nature means analysis of on-end profit and new business less important. For many non-life businesses, IFI 17 will not produce fundamental change, except that the application of PA will be more consistent. Now look at what happened here. Upon the inception of the contract, the zero, PAA is made up of the on-end premium and the deferred acquisition cost. Okay, which means commission you have paid to underwrite the policy will be considered as an asset. Okay, why on M premium, you consider as liability. When you net it off, you have a reduced amount of on M premium, which you show in your balance sheet as a liability for remaining coverage. As time goes on, portion of your acquisition cost is reduced based on amortizing them or expensing them as the case may be, which will now consider part of your insurance um, uh, service expense. On end premium will start to reduce because bulk of the time has elapsed. Okay, let me give you a scenario of this. Imagine this is a policy of one year, motor vehicle insurance, series of motor vehicle insurance in the courts for one year, but on average, the policy started in March, 1st of March, but the year runs from January to December. And that means that as of 31st December, this is what you are expected to have. Your acquisition cost will have been so reduced to two months ago. Your end premium will have been reduced to like two months ago. But what you have as bulk of liability will be liability for incurred claims, which means claims that are so called but are yet to be paid for. And by the time you get to the end of the coverage, you won't have any liability for uh, what's it called? Liability for remaining coverage. What you now have only left is liability for incurred claims because now the coverage period has expired. It's only those that have not crystallized that you are yet to set to that will consist your obligation as at the end of the year. And that's what you need to take into consideration. Which means this is a tail at inception. This is during the life up to the reporting period. And this is as at the end of the coverage, as at the end of the coverage. And that is that. Okay, now let's also look at it in these terms from illustration perspective. Now, this example illustrates the premium allocation approach for simplifying the measurement of the group of insurance contracts. What are the assumptions we have made here? An entity insurance contract on 1st of July, 20X1. The insurance contract have a coverage period of 10 months that ends 30th April. 20X2. The entity's annual reporting period ends on 31st December each year, and the entity prepares interim financial statement as of 30th June each year. Now, on the zero, what do we have? 
we have on expired premium of 1,220. And we have acquisition cost of 20. The liability we are going to recognize because we have not yet paid this acquisition cost and we are also, we have collected this premium. The total liability upon writing the contract on the zero is 1,240 in whatever currency it is. That's why I said, stated here, assume the acquisition cost has not been paid at the inception of the contract. Therefore, the total liability at inception is 1,240. Now, on initial recognition, the entity expects to receive premium of this, to pay directly at the table acquisition cash flow of this, to incur claim and be released from risk evenly over the coverage period, and that no contract will lapse during the coverage world period. Now, further the example, Fact and circumstances do not indicate that the group of contract is onerous. And two, all other amounts, including the investment component, are ignored for simplicity's sake. Now, what is the position now? In the subsequent period, what has happened? Immediately after the initial recognition, the entity received all the premium and pay all the acquisition costs. For the six month reporting period, ending 31st December 20X1, there were claims incurred of 600 with a risk adjustment for non-financial risk related to those claims of 36. Now, for the six-month reporting period ended 30th June 20X2, there were claims incurred of 400 with a risk adjustment of non-financial related to the claim of 24. This is as at end of X1, this is as at end of X2. Mm -hmm. On 31st August 20X2, the entity revises the estimate related to all claims and settles them by paying 1,070. And for simplicity, the risk adjustment for non-financial is related to the claim incurred is recognized in profit or loss when the claim are paid. Now, what has happened? As at end of 20X1, which is six months into the COVID period, out of the 10 months, what is our balance? Our balance is 1124. As the 1124, one, our liability has been extinguished because we are told that we are paid for the acquisition cost. Okay. Now, but our unexpired risk premium is 1124. Okay. As you arrive at 1124, we'll see it here. Okay. Now, look at it. The group of insurance contract qualified for premium allocation approach. In addition, the entity expects that one, the time between providing each part of the coverage and related premium due date is no more than a year. Consequently, the entity chooses not to adjust the kind amount of liability for remaining coverage to reflect the time value of money and the effect of financial risk. Therefore, no discounting or interest accretion is applied. Two, the claim will be paid within one year after the claim are incurred. Consequently, the entity chooses not to adjust the liability for incurred claim for the time value of money and the effect of financial risk, which means in this example, there were no adjustment for time value of money. Now, how do we arrive at this position? The amount of cash at the end of the year was 1,200 equal to the premium you have received, 1,220, less the acquisition cost of 20 that you have paid. Your cash is still 1,200 after paying your acquisition cost. Secondly, the amount of cash at the end of 20X2 of 130 equals the net cash inflow on 1st of January 20X1 of 12, which is this 12, less claim paid on 31st of 20X2. Remember, we are told that we have paid this claim. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, what balance results in your cash is 130. Now, the shares contract is the sum of the liability for remaining coverage and the liability incurred claim as illustrated in the next slide. Now, come and see what happened. Now, IFRS 70 requires the entity to provide reconciliation. Now, look at our reconciliation here. 
we have liability for remaining coverage and we have liability for incurred claims. Yes. Okay, now look at it one by one. Between the amount recognized in the statement of financial position and statement of profit or loss separately for the liability for remaining coverage and liability for incurred claims, and also the liability for incurred claims, disclosing a separate reconciliation for the estimate of the present value of future cash flows and the risk adjustment for non-financial risk. Now, see what has happened here. As of December 20X1, which is uh, some few months into the contract coverage period, what we have left is 122. Our revenue is 732. Okay, and our revenue will reduce the balance to 488. Okay, now in that manner, that balance is carried forward to 20x2. If you remember, your revenue will be based on time apportionment. Remember your time apportionment. You've done six out of 10 months. Can you check from your calculator six out of 10? How much is that? Six over ten times one to twenty is how much? Seven thirty-two. That's how we arrive at that. The balance of it is the on end premium, which is four eighty-eight. Now, by the time you get to June twenty X two, you will have recognized all because it will have expired. Therefore, the balance of the uh, on on end premium will have been recognized or will have been end because the period has elapsed. Okay, now for the liability, there's no recognition of any liability until June 20X2, which is a claim made. And there was a claim of 600,000 plus risk adjustment, everything moves to 636. Okay, and that is the liability for incurred claim, of which at the end of the day, how much have you paid? You find out that in December 20, S1, the claim was 636, okay, which will carry forward the yeah, end to 636. The one for 20, S2 up to June was 424, which means the all liability is 1060. But by the time you carry 1060 forward, you find out that the risk adjustments as further reduced from 70 to 60, which means there is more or less like a gain of 10. No, sorry, it increases from 60 to 70. Therefore, there's an additional expense of 10, okay, which increases our liability from 1060 to 1070, because actually it was 1070 that was eventually paid. And this is a form of trying to reconcile our position. And we are going to see it clearly when we reconcile position for building block approach or what we call the GMM later on. Okay, when you have the slide, you can be able to see it clearly also. All of what I've explained are what I've put behind your side as A, B, C, D, and what? E that support all of these calculations we've done. Okay, now what do you report in your income statement for the period? For the first six months in 20X1, I report insurance revenue of 732, insurance expense of 656. Where do you get 656 from? Remember, you have 60, 36, which is this, and you also have the portion of um, 20 acquisition costs. Remember the acquisition cost of 20. Yeah. That one is expense abstractly, okay? 20, that make up 656. Therefore, the profit in year one is 76. In year two, you have revenue of 488. Okay, and that's 488. And you have costs of 424. There's no longer acquisition costs because you have expensed it outrightly. And that is 424. 
and that gives us what 64. Now, in year three, there's no revenue, but you only have claim that yet to be settled. Therefore, there's no revenue in year three. Revenue is new, but you only have additional 10 you incur because of the difference between what you provided for it in 20 X, uh, as at 20, uh, June 20 X2, and as at the time you made payments. There has been movement in cash flow for settlement because of market factor by 10. And that shows your performance over each period. Okay, you can study it further. Now, the critical point is the point of measuring and accounting for the contractual service margin, because that is what depicts everything we have been doing since. Because if you come back here, What did we say? Everything from one, two, three, four, five ended up in six. Because one, two, three, four is making up five, and five is the same thing as six if it is profitable, or six is zero if it's onerous. And all of those things are what we are going to discuss now under the contractual service magic. Service magic. Now, what we are going to do now is that we will have five minutes of success and we'll come back for the full fledged discussion and model for module five. I think this is module four, yeah, module four. Module four is very critical because that's where we we'll place some maths and we need to refresh. You can take up water and come back for module five. Okay, now we are to discuss extensively on the contractual service margin. Okay, and contractual service margin only comes to play when we talk about the first two models, the GMM and the VFA. Okay, and um, we are going to look at it in four, uh, in four perspectives. Um, we look at CMM, CSM at initial recognition. We'll look at it as subsequent measurements. We'll look at it for insurance contracts held. And we'll look at the recognition of CSM in profit or loss. Okay, now we'll look at it based on the following underlining principle. I will need to pay more attention to that. Now let's start with CSM at initial recognition. We are going to look at it from two perspectives or two principles. Profit-oriented contract and loss-oriented contracts as a portfolio. Now CSM at initial recognition. We'll use some analogy to explain this. Consider what happened under an economic balance sheet when an insurer writes a new contract. If the contract is profitable, insurance recognizes a negative liability, effectively an asset. But if the contract is loss-making, the insurance recognizes a positive liability. In either case, an economic view results in insurance capitalizing at the point of sale the total profit or losses expected to be made under the contract over the lifetime. And this will speak volume to one or two things we want to consider. Now, what am I considering? Look at it. Under the GMM and VFE, the recognition of profit or losses begins with two deliberate asymmetric principles that are intended to depart from the economic view. The economic view means that when you have a profit, recognize an asset similar to derivative assets. When you have a loss, recognize a liability similar to derivative liability. But we are saying, no, we are not taking economic view. We are taking more of a prudent view, which is conservative in nature from the accounting perspective. And what is the view? The view is that, under principle one, is that when you have 
a short contract underwritten as a portfolio and they are profitable, you are not expected to recognize an asset. Therefore, you won't be allowed to recognize an asset because recognizing an asset means you have recognized a profit. And therefore, you'll be curtailed in recognizing the profits. And that is what brings about the CSM. Now, when an insurer writes a profitable business, it must not be allowed to recognize the expected profit for that business immediately and instead must suspend that profit as a liability and be recognized as a spread over time. And over time means over the coverage period. We say these are symmetric principles because what affects A does not necessarily affect B in similar manner. The second principle says that when an insurance rights loss-making business, it must not be allowed to defy the loss or spread it over time, but rather allow it to be recognized immediately. With that means that the contractual service margin is a fundamental concept introduced by IFR 17 that embodies this principle as its core. And it makes sense. And this is part of the reason why in the conceptual framework in 2018, prudence as a concept was reintroduced to the conceptual framework. Furthermore, what happens? Remember that we have told you that at the inception of a contract, you must group separately profitable contract within their various cohorts or portfolios. You group them separately from various portfolio or cohorts that are loss-making contracts. Likewise, you have those that are profit-making but are likely to be loss-making or onerous in the later future. Now let's leave the intermediary one. Let us focus on profitable contract and loss making. You find out that for profitable contract, the excess, which is here, that's supposed to be recognized as profit, is suspended and recognized as a liability through contractual service margin. Why here, the shortfall, which is a loss component here on the left hand side, is immediately recognized as a loss in your profit or loss, which is what principle one and principle two, which are invariant or asymmetric, are talking about. Now, let's look at it in practical sense. In the PV, present value of cash inflow is $1,000. Mm -hmm. I will put it in negative because it's a liability. You have collected money from a policy holder in advance.